Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Ben Hansen and this is the Why should I set this up when we have the man himself? Let's sit back here. Welcome to the deepest dive on Mass Effect, otherwise known as the best most thorough discussion about the game on the internet. Thanks for your support. Thank you, Neil Ross, voice of the Codex himself, for supporting <laughs> The Deepest Dive. Hello, everybody. This is The Deepest Dive. I'm joined by Leo Vader. Hello. Also, Joe Juba, formerly of Game Informer. Welcome, Joe. Hello. Thank you. And Sarah Elmale. Welcome, Sarah. Hello. I'm still uh, freaking out. That was amazing. <laughs> Oh yeah. my god. It was a weird thing out of the blue. Uh, it was to the point where I emailed uh, Neil Ross, voice actor short there yesterday, and then today I got the response to the email. I'm like, what is this email in my inbox? I didn't even remember doing this. Oh, that's right. This is amazing. Okay, this is great. Um, it's so lovely to have all of you here for the deepest dive on Mass Effect. As Neil said, it's the best, most thorough discussion about Mass Effect 1 on the internet. His Big words. Big old game club. His words, certainly not ours, sent through an email. <laughs> um, Sarah, thank you for being here. For a little background on you, if people aren't familiar, uh, you're a director, voice actor, most prominently known for Gone Home, Anthem, Jurassic World Revealed. Um, anything else you want to <laughs> throw in there? most prominently known for Jurassic World Revealed. <laughs> We're big fans. Have been isn't that the audio? Isn't that the audio game that we played on the GI show? Yeah, this is the weird yeah, thing. So Joe and Sarah, you're kind of meeting for the first time here, but technically, Sarah, we've all podcasted with you for so many hours because we went through all of <laughs> Jurassic World. <laughs> Spent a lot of intimate time with my voice. It was From fantastic. My um, but I'm excited to have your perspective here, not only because you've worked with Bioware, but also, believe it or not, there's a lot of voice acting in this game, and ah. I cannot wait for your insight into who does it best. You have to pick by the end of the podcast here. So please get ready for that. Uh, Joe Juba, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is fun. I've been looking forward to this. Joe is, <laughs> man, last night when you told me that you were digging through and reading the community comments ahead of time, I was like, oh my God, is Joe looking forward to this? That is a hardcore <laughs> plunge that nobody else has taken. That's amazing. But I guess it's understandable. Yeah. I mean, it turns out that Mass Effect has been like one of my favorite games since it first released. You know, it's been a big, it's been a big thing for me. So the idea to like come and talk about it with experts and enthusiasts and all of that, like, yeah. And of course, the MinMax community who makes this all happen. That's right. They make it all happen by supporting MinMax at any tier over at patreon.com slash MinMax with two N's. If you support us even at that $2 tier, you can submit a comment for us to read on the show. And if you support us at that $5 tier, you unlock the podcast version of the full Game Club discussion, of the full Deepest Dive, also the podcast version of MinMax Council, our Patreon-exclusive podcast, early access to the MinMax show, uh, podcast version of all of our interviews, Max spoilers. There's a lot of benefits. You can compete in Trivia Tower, so if you enjoy this type of content, you can support it and join it by going over to patreon.com slash MinMax with two ends. We appreciate it, because we have a lot, we have a lot of Mass Effect to get through. But what this is, is a huge Game Club discussion for Mass Effect 1. This is the first third so we're going to be talking about everything in Mass Effect 1 up until you leave this Citadel in this discussion. Now, here's the thing. We had a Twitter poll asking for people that are playing along for the Deepest Dive, their experience with Mass Effect, and 25% of people playing are completely new to the series. So we what? Do, yeah, so we do not want to spoil anything beyond this section for each discussion. So we're not going to do oh. too many, like, cheeky nods of, like, oh, you like this character now. You wait. just wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's going to be All tough right. not to Go do ahead. it, but try and stay clean on that stuff. We won't spoil anything beyond the stopping point for each discussion. So for here, it's when you leave the Citadel. Um, and just for oh. the rest of those stats... Uh, That's going to be tricky, too, because there are, like, things that we, there up. are, like, things and names uh, relating to characters that we may know, but we don't know this stuff about them yet, even. Yeah, just so. pretend you're a complete idiot, Joe. We'd appreciate it. Oh, it is man. my first time playing through, so I, you can just use my reactions to go off of if you're going too far. If you my look nervous at anything, I'm I'll try and backpedal. Just look, look angry and upset. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. yeah, yeah, I mean, Leo, should... you're gonna have to you have to make a point to just shout what very surprised to make us think that we've screwed up <laughs> every, no, like, that guy? Yeah, yeah, every 10 minutes. Just keep us on our toes here. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we should run down our experience here. Mass Effect 1 is my favorite of the trilogy. I love this yeah. game. I considered it my favorite game of this generation. And at the same time, I realized like I think I've only played this game like one and a half times. So I feel like a rookie. Like I forgot a surprising amount of this stuff. So that's my perspective. But obviously love the whole trilogy. Joe, your experience with Mass Effect is? Uh, this is 
it's not my favorite of the trilogy, but it's actually the one that I've played the most. Because this was back, they, they announced that it was a trilogy from the get-go, and that all of your choices would matter later on. Yeah. So without knowing exactly to what extent those choices would matter, I was real interested in seeing all of the different permutations. And I was really interested in getting all of the trophies for it. So I ended up playing this game through seven times start to finish, like oh when it came God. out in 2007. Wow. Wow. With the idea of like, these are all of the different shepherds I'm going to carry forward into di into different playthroughs. Oh my <laughs> god, that is amazing. <laughs> did you take notes? No. On who no. each one was and what they did? You know, I probably should have, but no, I didn't. No, I just sort of, I sort of trusted myself that I'd be, that I'd remember who this weirdo shepherd was versus that one. But <laughs> oh over, god. as, as I, as the series continued, it sort of got honed down to or like like uh, whittled down to sort of a basically just two shepherds that I carried shepherd in. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sarah, what's your experience with this? Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, well, I had three shepherds. I had three. So I played through this one three times. And I think I don't know that I actually completed three with all three of them. I think I got right to the end game with my second and then I didn't get my third one through. But um, I played it. Yeah, I played it right when it came out. I'd been a fan since um, probably KOTOR. I was, you know, I missed the Baldur's Gate era, but I jumped in on KOTOR and I loved Jade Empire. And um, so I was very excited for this. Um, and stop me if I've told this story on this podcast before, but like my setting for Mass Effect 1 was like I moved to New York City. It was the beginning of any kind of professional. I was like out of school and everything. I like moved and we like shared me and my boyfriend shared an apartment with like five other people in Brooklyn. We had like a, a dresser from my childhood, a four foot deep RCA TV and a bed bug infested mattress. And that was like it and an <laughs> Xbox. So I played through Mass Effect and wondered if maybe I would have a career in the arts <laughs> in New York City and played this obsessively and forgot to eat. And my boyfriend would like come in and make pasta and be like, you need food. And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> um, and so like that and falling in love with these characters, falling in love with Jen's performance, falling in love with this world. Um, really marks like a very, very tender, like interesting, powerful moment in my whole life and career, certainly. So that was my Mass Effect 1 experience. Yeah. And Leo, you're kind of some fake ass gamer boy or something. What's going on up there? Yeah. Fake gamer to hear speaking. <laughs> I have tried Mass Effect 1 a couple times, but I always just kind of bounced off. And I think it was the the combat for me. I always heard like you skipped a Mass Effect 2. The combat's way better, but it was hard for me to justify doing that and missing the whole story of the first one. Yeah. And so do you remember like how far you got in Mass Effect 1 before? Not much farther than this segment of the deepest dive. Okay, like perfect. The one other planet afterwards. Okay, this is going to be fantastic. Uh, people watching us live, by the way, at the Backstage Pass here on Patreon, David Dillinger points out the very smart take that 25% of people on Twitter hadn't played the game before, and that's the exact same as the panel. So we have the perfect makeup here for talking all about Mass Effect, because... I was, Joe, you're very smart, and you came up with kind of the stopping points for this game club, and I was mm. worried going in, and I'm like, is there going to be enough to talk about in this one? And then right when I got to the Citadel, I was like, there is too much to talk about here. I forgot, <laughs> like, this is all I yeah. want to talk about with Mass Effect is just, like, racial politics on the Citadel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in terms of our count, we're looking at what? Maybe it took me about five or six hours to hit the stopping point. Yeah. But it is such, well, and we can dig into this once we get going proper, but like that, the introductory hours are so dense. Yeah. In so many ways that it's, it, it's, it's fun, fun stuff to dig into for sure. Yeah. So Joe, you can't do this because you cheated, but normally we like to kick off the deepest dive with a little game we like to call Most Common Comment where the people on the panel try and guess what you think people wrote in the most about for this section of the game club. Leo, do you have any ideas about what the most common comment would be? How good the Citadel looks now? How good it looks. Okay, so I'll guess. Sarah, anything specific here? Space cops slash space racism. Ooh, space cops. Interesting being, guess. All right. Being, you know, shocking, perhaps. Okay, not quite. I think it's it was largely about just talking about uh, the pacing of the Citadel. Kind of layout and pacing and frustrations with the Citadel. Oh, kind sure. of be my read. Did you have another read, Joe, since you also read all of them? <laughs> like a maniac? Yeah. My, I mean, I, it got to the point where I was kind of skimming more than reading. Yeah. There were like, over oh, there are almost 200 comments there, I think. It's but, a lot. Uh, I... I actually think that one of the most common sentiments I saw was actually people uh, complimenting the voice performers. Yes. Yeah. That, that is a very common thing here. And I'm not just 
you know, because Sarah's on board. But, you know, it, it, that is a thing people really notice and appreciate about Mass Effect, I think. And that's like a huge thing. I mean, thing. I sure did. Yeah. yeah. That's why I, part of why I do this now. Right, right. But like it's such a huge thing about creating my shepherd and really worrying about it's a whole thing about like, is this going to feel like my old shepherd? I don't know. And then the second I hear Jennifer Hale, it's like, OK, no matter what small details I messed up, like this is absolutely my shepherd. Like that voice is just so rich and locks you back in that zone. But yeah, uh, Joe Halaska here is with you. He left a comment saying the most significant thing I'm noticing is how incredible the voice acting is. Jennifer Hale's Commander Shepherd is a masterpiece right from the start. The one that really stood out to me was also David Keith's Captain Anderson, mostly because his voice is so iconic to me due to his role as Goliath and Disney's Gargoyles. Well, of course. It's David, but yes, King. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. um, Josh Carmel writes in as well, saying Stephen Barr as Rex is so enjoyable to listen to with how satisfyingly bassy his voice is. Yeah, I think like the small distinctions for the voices for the aliens is just so perfect. Like that subtle reverb for the Turians. It's just like those small little tweaks to help differentiate all the alien races is so smart. Um, but you know, all those all those technical qualities that really um, give them distinct, um, you know, voice prints are so iconic. They're just and they're well differentiated and they just stay with you. You know, the sound of a Turian, if you heard some that processing laid on top of somebody in your life, like you'd be like, you know. Yeah. You know. Are, are you able to like separate your enjoyment of the game from your career, Sarah? Or when you listen to this, are you just listening to like everything Jennifer Hale does? But like, that's an interesting choice. That's an interesting choice. I mean, I was at the time. Like, I don't know why. I've I've been interested in voice acting and voice actors and kind of like curious about it on that level before I started as before I started doing it. So like, I never wasn't kind of like ooh. Like, I was always looking up who was on IMDb and thinking like that's interesting. Like, thinking that way is what led me to think, oh, this is someone's job. Like, they're in a booth somewhere. That's how that works. That's interesting. So I kind of always have dual processing going, um, and I always have, which is funny, even though now I do it for a job. But yeah. Um, yeah. I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with all these performances hold up so well. And I want to shout out, um, we'll get through, when we get to, I think, Mass Effect 3, um, Caroline Livingstone, who is in-house at, at Bioware and directs now and directed me and is amazing and has just an extraordinary casting taste. And is, her, her artistic values and her casting values are so wonderful and human and, and unique, I think, in the industry. But Ginny McSwain, who's also a legendary voice director, um, I think worked on one and two. I'd have to double check that. But shout out to voice direction. Ha <laughs> ha! Because that's so much of what lifts these really these nuances and gives people permission to make interesting choices and all that good stuff. Yeah. And it's like uh, people probably put a lot of weight on casting, but that direction right. aspect and just I, I heard an interview with somebody. I forget who it was. Maybe it was even you, Sarah. I forget. But just talking ah. about uh, directing voice acting and just how intense it is for how closely you have to listen, how like mm -hmm. surprisingly straining it is for like, all right, I'm working just an eight hour day. How hard can that be? But when you have to like listen to every drop of somebody's voice to try and stitch stuff together and give advice like that has to be so exhausting it is i find it more tiring even when i've had a vocally stressful day acting i tend to feel like my tank is kind of filled up like i might need a nap or something but with directing the, when i first started doing like back-to-back four-hour sessions a few days in a row i would just like crap i was useless i was mentally and physically useless at the end because you are listening with your full presence, you owe that actor your full presence of mind and, and attention as they're working um, and listening for details in there. But you're also holding the whole game world in the back of your head. So it's kind of double. In a way, it's all, sort of the actor's trying to do that as well, imagine, so they can react to things. But a director is holding, placing all of those lines in the context of the world and holding the game world in their head at the same time as well. So you're kind of like thinking and listening in a couple different places. It's 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 a lot. Yeah. 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 And then, con especially with a game like this, character continuity, conversation continuity, keeping all of those things, you know, things, how are they going to stitch, all of that stuff. It's a lot to, to hold in your brain. I cannot imagine. Uh, Grizzled Gaming here has a good way to kick it off. He says, first things first, for you returning players, did any of you get goosebumps at the music when the game booted up? I cried. Anybody? <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> yeah. So there, there are two different boot ups, right? There's the, there's the press any button on Mass Effect screen. Right. And then there's the... The one where it's like the sort of uh, uh, images are floating around in the background where you actually select. And it's that second one for me that is the iconic Mass Effect sound that, I don't know if chills is the right word, but it's definitely a moment of like transportation. A moment of, that's right, I stared at this menu for so long. I had this going on in the background when I made dinner. Like that's that's just a total like... That's that menu is like the soundtrack of Joe's 2007 right there. 
Yes. And like, yes, the character creation music too was just one of those like double whammy of a mood setter of like, oh, that's oh. right. I listened to this music so much in my life trying to get these details exactly <laughs> mm-hmm. right. But Sarah, it was tears yeah. immediately. I, I actually feel I, I'm, I'm new to streaming. I have never streamed before and I'm a helpless baby, but I was like, maybe I'll test some OBS <laughs> settings on like and like boot up this game. And then I just like start to start to well up and I'm talking to my friend Edward at the same time and kind of trying to hold it together. But like it was within two seconds of just listening to the music that I started to like my body just started to just go back to that time and space. And I think it was you. You knew this. You knew Vigil, the track title when we yeah. talked about it last time. And I, I couldn't find it, but but vigil is such a great word because it feels kind of sacred. Like the tone of it is so sweet and sort of and imaginative. It feels like there's hope and kind of like mystery in the galaxy. But it all, and you're seeing kind of photos of your friends kind of come in and recede. It just feels very cozy and very special. And like it's going to take care of you. This game is going to give you lots to kind of like care about. Um, so I think it's such a powerful opener for the for the experience. Leo, did you dwell on that at all? You just <laughs> new game immediately. Stuff Cheetos in your mouth, farted twice, push start, let's go. Yeah, I wouldn't say I dwelled on it, but I appreciated it. I think the music throughout has been awesome. Yeah. As uh, far as just feeling like you're in the world, yeah. Yeah, Craig Belmont here submitted a comment on Patreon, just said, synth, period, music, period. <laughs> yeah, Craig, that kind of says it all. Like, that Citadel music loop gets drilled into your head in such a big way. It reminds me of like Balam Garden from Final Fantasy VIII, Joe, where it's like a mm-hmm. big environment, you spend so much time exploring, and just like that music will not leave your head for days. So while, while we're on the menu, talking about the menu area, <laughs> yeah. there were, like I wrote down a few notes here before I even entered the game proper because there were a few things on that menu that I thought that I thought were funny. One, that I don't know if it was there before or not. Like I don't know if it's an in-joke or not, but on the menu, if you go into options... There's, there's an option that's just calibration. And I don't know. I don't know if that's is, is, I think that's like I forget exactly what was in it. It was like screen your brightness or gamma or, or whatever, that kind of thing. Yeah, but that's such an that's such an in joke with Mass Effect of like Garrus having to do his calibrations. Oh, that's is interesting. That a spoiler. Garrus is deep love of calibration. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that's important fair. information. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I uh, dug through those menus too, Joe. I was really struck and maybe it's been patched now, but. Basically, I started up this game and then went back on Game Pass and started up the original Mass Effect one just to have that point of comparison. And I did it reverse. I, I played the old one first and then it... And I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah, but jumping to that original one, is like, this looks like dog ass. And it's like, well, no, a huge part of that is that film grain that they default on with for the 360 oh. version of Mass Effect. And what's crazy is that in this one, they have the toggle for film grain in the menu... But as far as I can tell, it doesn't do anything. It's just a false toggle when you turn it on and off. Am I nuts? Am I missing something? No, it turns the fil- film grain off. Really? Yeah. Wait, in the new I one? Funny. That, that's one of the notes that I wrote down is in the, there, are, there are three things in that graphics options that you can adjust. And I went in there and immediately toggled all three of them away from the default. One is the motion blur. Yeah. Turn that off. One is the film grain. Turn that off. And then it had like favor quality or favor frame rate and it defaulted to quality. I was like, no, give me the frame rate. Yeah. So for I was just sure. like, like and that's one thing, like when you're, you know, reviewing games for years and years, you just sort of get in a habit of before I play anything, I immediately go into the, me- into the options menu just to see like, what, what can I tweak? Cause you don't want to make some dumb phrase or some dumb thing later on. That's like, the game doesn't let you change to easy. It's like, yeah, it does. Right, right. Right. So uh, I just sort of check all that thing by reflex. And yeah, so that, that's where I went first thing. Uh, yeah, what's everybody playing on? I'm on Xbox myself. Sarah, I think you're also Xbox? I intended to do Xbox, and then I thought maybe I would start streaming it ever, maybe. And so I, just, I switched to PC. Okay. Um, that's new for me. I'm not sure. I was seeing somewhere that controller support is, like, I don't know, kind of funny on on PC. Oh, really? I had some issues the first time, the first session, this last two sessions, it's been stable, but I was like, it's, it's literally a 360 controller. I was like, excuse me, original. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I switched to PC. Nice. But I, I, I was not the whole generation. I was not a PC gamer at all. Oh, that wow. I've had a desktop in a minute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember my second run in Mass Effect 1 that I didn't finish. I remember I started that on PC and it was like, oh, it's just night and day. It was so nice to, to have yeah. that back then. Uh, Leo, you're on PC for this one, right? I'm on PS5 playing oh. the PS4 version. Yeah, oh, while thinking about the PlayStation 3. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Wait a minute. Is it a free upgrade to the PS5 version if you want it? Or how's that? It's just that the code was PS4. No, there isn't a PS5 version. It's just a PS4 game that plays on PS5. Is that what's happening? Oh, that's yeah. weird. Okay, gotcha. Uh, yeah. Connor submits a comment saying, I'd love to hear about each of your Shepard designs. I decided to recreate yeah. the same Shepard I used from all my previous playthroughs for this series. For me, that look for Shepard is canon, and it feels weird to change it. Also, hi, Joe. Big fan of your writing, says Connor. Connor, thank you. <laughs> yeah, what, what's your what's your shepherd strategy here, Joe? Boy, so I actually, as I was getting started with it, I have I have the tendency, I think we've talked about this a little bit already, but like I I sort of have a canon shepherd in my head, which is like female shepherd, paragon, definitely has a consistent look that um that i ended up using throughout the series that in my mind is like my shepherd and i was about to start up this playthrough as that shepherd again and i put up just like a, a dumb tweet that was like hey should i do the same old shepherd or a new weird shepherd and i knew as soon as i did that what are you doing yeah. the, you know how that's going to turn out yeah. it was like not just new but like weird people yeah. are like, oh yeah give me weird and also someone had commented like there's sort of a living vicariously because no one has the courage when they replay mass effect to themselves do a new weird shepherd because <laughs> everyone wants to do the same shepherd that they're familiar with yeah but if someone says should i do it then it's almost like a yeah yeah you do it do it do it so that's the way that's the way the poll went so i ended up abiding by it and i did a weird my shepherd is a renegade male shepherd who's got like almost like a pompadour, the closest <laughs> thing that they have to a pompadour haircut. Slow down. Uh, and this sort of like biker, the biker mustache. <laughs> and it doesn't annoy you. Like, I guess when you've played the game that many times. Well, so here's the thing. It's, it doesn't look, he doesn't look ridiculous or ugly or whatever he looks evil that's kind of the idea okay. right as i'm doing doing a renegade shepherd so i wanted him to look like sinister which which this does but it's not like he's my you know turn all the sliders on the far as far as they'll go on any area like freak shepherd it's not monster factory yeah like elena yeah, p here exactly. elena submitted a comment on patreon asking how many times we had to restart because uh she had to restart several times because my character kept looking like an elcor and a batarian had a baby <laughs> <So>. <laughs> You know, I understand it. Uh, I, I was really meticulous about, I thought about, well, I thought about maybe going a new route and then I realized like, I love these games and the shepherd is so central in my mind. I just need to stick to the shepherd I know. Largely, I'm going to make the same choices I made that I really remember. I'm going to be as boring as possible. So it's like, it goes back to old Malin shepherd. Um, so I got really dorky and I had to like, pull out a picture i had my wallet in my pocket watch no of like my old shepherd that i remember <laughs> that i remember i took because of that nonsense with mass effect 3 where you couldn't import it wouldn't import your custom shepherd at launch so with mass People effect forget that it was infuriating yeah. and so what i had to do for that was like for mass effect 3 was to go back to my mass effect 1 shepherd take a picture of the screen and then recreate yeah. her in mass effect 3 so i went back yeah. and i had that same photo saved in google photos so i just went off that and tried to recreate this shepherd and it's it's pretty darn close i'm pretty happy even though it's frustrating the fact that i had to make this shepherd so many times now but uh yeah so she's a colonist and she's ruthless and she's an mm. inf infiltrator Nice. Yeah, I want to know classes too. Mine's an adept. I really like that. Uh, the biotic go. Yeah, uh, Sarah, what'd you go with? So I had three. I mean, I'm interested. That, that's a, I, I did not relate to the like doing the same shepherd every time kind of stuck it. Like I have my first is probably my headcanon just kind of because it was my first and it was kind of close to me. It was leaned heavy Paragon. But even back in the day, I had my next two. I had an African-American soldier and then I had a Japanese-American engineer. Like I was always I was like, I'm going to do different shepherds. They should be different shepherds. Like I mean, if I want to see the breadth of this game and this character, like I'm going to differentiate. Yeah. Um, so the one that I did this time Looks like this. I was like, I have that lip shade. That's what I thought I'd wear today, <laughs> even though I am not pulling it off the way she does. But um, so she's she's somewhere in between. She's a little more severe than my original. She's kind of she's sort of she's mostly paragony, but I think that like maybe maybe this charts my growth as a human being. I have less tolerance for garbage and bullshit. So I'm mm -hmm. like, excuse me. So like, I, so there are some renegade things where I'm like, what, what? Like, come on, let's all right. 
or I, knock it off. I'm totally with you. Um, I think it's a more interesting way to play instead of I'm sticking yeah. full Paragon or full Renegade, but it's like, I'm going to play the way I would, where it's like, yeah. I'm mainly understanding, but every once in a while it's like, yeah. nope, cut that crap out right now. Yeah. Like Harkin, you're like, mm, come on, you know, I'm going <laughs> to knee you through this bar. Like, no, actually, please. I'm on Harkin's side, Sarah. I think he gets a bit, no. What, Harkin? <laughs> All He's in a on really, speaking of great acting, I was like, you're selling me this horrible language. Like, you're the worst person, but you're great. He's a terrible sleaze. Eh, great spread sleaze. space herpes. Yeah, blah, the yeah like, like, holy snacks. All right. We're just, okay. Also, we haven't um, cured yeah. herpes in the future? Come on, Mass Effect world. We can do all this stuff, but herpes is still running rampant? <laughs> Can't, like in the future, they're like we could we can you know we have mass relays, but like one sentence of a believable Saren voice print <laughs> is in, in irrefutable evidence of his like betrayal. I was like, as a voice actor, that hurt. I was like, uh, no. <laughs> okay, so quick quick aside there, yeah, because uh, we already talked about some voice stuff. And Sarah, I'm I'm sure that you know this guy. I I mean, okay. you probably even know how to pronounce his name, Fred okay. Ta- Tatashore. Okay, who's a, that- so wonderful. He is like, like Saren is so interesting is like voice performance is so interesting because it's so even and measured. And normally, you know, you see these, I am the dark world, like yes. sci-fi bad guys. Right. But the other interesting thing is that that voice actor, I think he does so much of just like monstrous stuff. Yeah. I remember he was in, he like, uh, if you played Metal Gear Solid four, he was the sort of beast voices right. of the beauty and the beast unit right yes so like like someone right, yeah. it, it, like a performer who is so well known for these monstrous things and yet really pulls off this like very even keeled like sort of simmering sinister evil i think is really cool yeah it reminds yeah, in, me in, in, go ahead oh no i was just gonna say like it reminds me even of like rafe in uncharted 4 like there's something so cool about a villain yeah, who's uh-huh. just like understated and i love saren so much he's my favorite He's intelligent and silky and and Fred has so much in his instrument that's burly and beefy and gurgly and like all of his other things or, you know, and he he plays brutes all the time. And so having someone who sounds who's like a sort of a Shakespearean villain is so refreshing and he just nails it. He's wonderful. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. Um, Leo, we didn't forget about you, little rookie boy. (laughs) Sorry, don't let us be too (laughs) condescending to the inductor. But what'd you do for your shepherd? Oh, honey, what was your feeling here? What's what's baby's first shepherd? (laughs) Yes. You don't want to know. Oh, no, we do. We do, Leo. Come on. Tell the class. Ooh. She's a vanguard. She has short gray hair. My girlfriend designed her. Oh. I think she did a great job. Oh, interesting. Are you going for like a, a canonically old shepherd in your mind with the gray hair or is it just cool, hip young person dying their hair gray? Little older, but also hair graying early. Mm, yeah, and all the other weird. backstory choices, don't care. That's all I need for my shepherd backstory. <laughs> well, it's interesting. My Sinclair wrote in with a, a good take saying, a fact that really stood out to me this time and is affecting how I play shepherd is shepherd's age. Apparently, canonically, shepherd is 29. My first time what? playing. What? Yeah. Saying my first time <laughs> playing that may not have stood out to me because of my age, but I turned 32 while playing this time. I'm sorry, 42 while playing this time. And it blows me away to think of how young shepherd is. But that is such a fascinating idea of like changing your perspective on Shepard because you have now passed Shepard's age. What's crazy about that to me is you can say, oh, yeah, Shepard's 29, but like the default Shepards don't look 29. Uh, But then also they have it seems like they have a level of experience that you would not be likely to see among a 29 year old. I mean, 29-year-old soldier, it depends, I guess, on some backstory stuff here, but, like, it seems reasonable that you could get there by age 29. But I mean, you compare it to, like, Career-wise? JRPGs, where it's, like, you know, Cloud Strife is, like, 14 years old or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, this actually feels like, wow, 29 for an RPG protagonist. That's pretty good. A little long in the tooth there, Shepard. Yeah, Point and Jen's, Jen's, voice, Jen's voice reads is, like, a solid, experienced 30-something to me, too. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, hey, how about this for an idea, everybody? You know, like, I think, I forget if FemShep is based on somebody, but the male shepherd's based on that model or whatever, mm. I forget their name. Um, and there's so many situations like that in games where they're taking for facial inspiration from a real person. Like, you know, Dina in Last of Us Part Two. it's like, that is a real person. You see a picture of her, it's like, oh, that's just Dina walking around, right? Okay, what about this, Sarah? You're, you're in mm-hmm. Hollywood, right? You're hip. <laughs> I know, okay, but what about this? Yeah. What about this for like the biggest impact you could have for the cheapest casting budget, relatively? Is you make an indie film and hire all these people whose faces have been in games, and imagine you can get them for pretty cheap, and you would have like secretly a superstar indie film. 
<laughs> Interesting. Just, and so you hope that they act. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I mean, I many mean, of them are also actors, but like, you know, I mean, you're getting models or whatever. I mean, it's a likeness you're taking, right? I guess so. Yeah, it all comes but down to sure. direction. You really got to coach them the right way. But wouldn't that be cool to have like an indie film that's just like the Super Smash Brothers of video game would, characters somehow? Yeah, just, just, just for a YouTube video, just to see these folks interacting with each other and doing very, very normal things like yes. know, going for milk runs and whatever. Yeah, that would be funny. Okay, That'd be thank dope. you. That's all I was looking for, it. Sarah. Somebody telling me that would be funny. Thank you. It almost okay. feels so, really <laughs> nostalgic seeing... Hearing Keith David's voice and seeing somebody who's not designed to look like him. You know, I feel like this is before the trend where if you got a big actor, you wanted people to recognize them and know they're in your game. Yeah. That's what we're doing face cap and pcap for facial capture and performance capture. Right. At that time. Right. It Which is, is why you have lovely. I wrote down all the gestures I could find, the banked gestures that we could find, the like this, this stuff and the this. You know, <laughs> rubbing my face on your face is a big one with the consort. Mm. I was just like trying to keep track of all of the data on that. This is the angry point from Medina. Yep. Only one We've character has this one, but I really love that the old bartender in the Citadel is like wiping down the counter. And I was yeah. thinking like, is that just weird? <laughs> what are we doing? Are bartenders only allowed to do that one move in all fiction? <laughs> I've never seen an actual bartender wipe down any counter in real life. He can't even serve you a drink. He just gives you information <laughs> and wipes down a counter. <laughs> you okay, love I was like, sure. And he's like, mm, here's yeah, I was very disappointed. I was very disappointed. <laughs> like, what are you wiping down, guy? You won't give out drinks. You know? <laughs> Your own spit. Uh, and everyone who's there is just off at their own table anyway. They're not even hanging out at the bar. <laughs> including yeah, my favorite mess. guy, which is the guy in the corner. <laughs> oh, my God. Hang on. I have to find this stupid line that he says where he's just sitting there in the corner. And then he just goes. This place seems strange. Wish there were more humans around. <laughs> like, man, you're at like an alien space station. <laughs> what do you <laughs> want, cool. you freak? What's with all these non-humans? It's the dumbest line. We're very bad guests, I think is yeah. one takeaway from this from this game. Or, <laughs> humans are bad at playing of, well with others. Yeah. Speaking of motion capture, what about the what about the dudes who are just sitting there passively unmoving watching the Asari like <laughs> wriggle in front of them they haven't like, blinked so for 24 insane. hours i'm enjoying the show <laughs> yeah <laughs> so and you can't tip that was something i noticed this time around because so i was like i'd like to tip the ladies please <laughs> okay, it's been abolished by then mm. do you think this is maybe diving too deep in the weeds but <laughs> all of our weird asari ladies make a make a living wage we are proudly a no tip and staff <laughs> right, no tip, and 401k we're, we're doing all right you know and a union that would be great that's so, the future yeah. <laughs> it's so to me that like in the codex they mention that like ah the asari they bond with people <laughs> this is my terrible uh, paraphrasing of the codex but when they bond pe for pe with people and because of that because they can bond with either gender they've gotten like this reputation for being promiscuous right which is Thanks, interesting guys. but then it's like well then how does that square with the kind of asari strip club on the Citadel, do you think it's like that reputation just got rolling and then it's like, well, we have to hire Asaris because, you know, they're they're so promiscuous. And that's just like the weird stereotype that's continuing. Yeah, I think it's a bisexual prom like promiscuity stigma and it just extends to sex work, which is amazing. Thank, thank you, Sarah, for having <laughs> a know? very informed, immediate take on that uh, codex theory. Thank As you. a bisexual, I have opinions. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to remember, are they you all know? Asari in that club? Or no, just most of them. I think there's at least one human dancer entertaining a couple with another human dancer on the lap or something. I think there's a couple of humans in there. Okay. But mostly, sorry. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, Richard Heron writes in asking, uh, hey, it's my first time playing. Is this game funny? I found myself laughing out loud often between piercing eye contact from default male shepherd to awkward tone shifts and pacing in conversation. I'm delighted by the whole experience. Am I just easily entertained or is this part of the game's charm? I've never heard anyone refer to the series as being funny, but I'm laughing so much. <laughs> Unintentionally funny, I guess, is what Richard's going for there. I mean, I think there's funny writing in the game, yeah. but like the part that really kills me is the ending of conversations are standing out in such a big way now where it's always just the character like, well, there we go, Shepard. And then just like yeah. turning to the <laughs> side and doing that walk away. The fact that everybody does that in such a standard way is so silly. Yeah. They're like, Will you help me recover my wife's body? I should go. <laughs> yeah, I have to go. I have to go. <laughs> okay. Well, moving on. So, no, thank you. This actually, this, this touches on one of the things that I wanted to, wanted to, talk about a little bit here. One of the things I took notes about mm. is that I think um, 
one of the interesting things about this game is that because Mass Effect has become this, like, uh, uh, just this huge, like, iconic entity in the gaming space, and because it also lasted for as long as it did. I mean, I forget when Mass Effect 3 came out. 2012. 2012? Okay. So it sort of persisted for a while that it's kind of, it's easy to forget what the landscape looked like in 2007 yeah when this game came out because we can look at those conversations and stuff now and say like wow that's a little that's a little janky but like i also think back to like this it is in 2007 when mass effect came out that's only six years ahead of like final fantasy 10 yeah. When that came out and think about like the advances in cinematography and voice acting there. So I made a little list here just of a couple things to think about of like what other games came out in 2007. Right. Yes, right. Please. Yeah. So we've got this also 2007 is like probably the best year for new IP in video game history. Absolutely. 2007 is mm-hmm. uh, number one. Yeah. You have the first Assassin's Creed, the original Bioshock. Oh. The, fir- the first Witcher on PC. Wow. Uh, Portal. Oh my God. And Uncharted. What? Yeah, it's a it's an insane year, but that's a great way to put it in perspective. I'm totally with you. Like yeah. Chris Martin submitted a comment saying, "I don't remember those faces looking quite so bad back in the day." But that I being do. said, he's having a blast. And Miguel uh, Majaj wrote in saying, uh, "I love the Mass Effect series. Well, what's catching me with the Legendary Edition so far is some of the old jank in the trank, as a wise man once said. The animations for the character models when they turn around to the speaking characters they seem so robotic. But the tune comes in here with a comment that's perfect, saying my immediate reaction was how aged this game looked and felt. But then I thought Mass Effect One came out 13 years ago." And he says, to give myself a little appreciation, I looked up some games that came out in 1994, which is 13 years before Mass Effect 1. And oh, that, yeah. that's the gap that uh, notable, notable titles there are Donkey Kong Country, Super Metroid, Earthbound, and Earthworm Jim. Just for a frame of reference for like the distance between us and the original Mass Effect, I still think it looks pretty good once you turn that film grain off, even in the original. But the Legendary Edition, yeah, it, it's, it's great to have a good looking version of this game even if i haven't been wowed by too many things visually especially not anderson's nostrils and ears like when you can really see like the holes in there it's not looking good (laughs) normally i mean most of the i mean so not everyone all like all four of us are playing the legendary edition but not everyone who's participating here is yeah but i think anderson's face is one of the things that i would say is a definite downgrade yes in this legendary edition there's yeah. something about it seems like they shaved off his eyebrows or made them <laughs> a lot lighter you idiot i told you we shouldn't have shaved off his eyebrows <laughs> for the legendary edition <laughs> well, in the legendary edition we reinstated the uh, piece of lore where he lost a bet right before the game started <laughs> his face had to shave his eyebrows. he just has like it just looks greasy there's just something about the texture action is yeah it's something off but his voice is so good i think that character is so good that it's like i'll just yeah. close my eyes every time anderson's on screen <laughs> i can really enjoy him as a man <sighs> and keith david in life wears like or at least when i he was at my agency in new york and so i'd see him in the lobby sometimes oh, and he wears like full kind of african regalia like he he does just to visit his agent and i was just like he would come into the space and i'd be like you god among men <laughs> like oh my lord honestly and he carries awesome. himself with such it's 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 a wild thing i yeah, am he's a powerful dude so jealous of you thinking about like walking yeah. into a building the person i would most like to be standing in there for a surprise keith david probably number one on that list <laughs> Also, you want to be in the room. You want to feel the acoustics yeah. of that voice. Oh my it's god! <laughs> Can stunning. you imagine? Yeah. Also, it's the mm-hmm. second time we've kissed Keith David's ass on the podcast or on the deepest dive because we talked about the thing a lot and how great Childs is is the thing. We're the deepest dive on the thing. If you want to find that, archive. avoid. I say. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. A lot to get through. Charlie Hunter was annoyed that uh, when they pre-selected uh, Jane Shepard. They didn't realize that it also auto-selected the character's backstory in class. I can see that being really frustrated. It's weird that like if you get yeah. the look, then it'll just lock you in there so that they actually back out and recreate the character. But mm. I get that's frustrating. Uh, Tanner Metven writes in and says, One small moment in Mass Effect 1 that does so much with so little is the opening exposition, explaining the titular Mass Effect. Specifically the quote, The Civilization of the Galaxy... 
Oh, the civilizations of the galaxy call it boom title. I mean, the music sting, there's everything. But saying, this may not seem like much, but I remember first playing this game and how that text really set the tone that humans are new to this galactic civilization and our greatest discovery is routine in galactic life. It does a great job of conveying humanity's place in this world and thus how you and your fellow human characters will be treated throughout the experience. That sums up a whole lot of what I, I love about it. this. Um, Raise your hand if you forgot what the Mass Effect was. Oh, it's absolutely. <laughs> I completely <laughs> forgot what it was or what it did. I, I know, it's forgot. like Mass Relays are so important, but the idea of like, okay, so that Mass Relays yeah. are just enacting the Mass Effect, it's it's a nonsense right, I was word. like slingshotting across, I don't know, Garrus is my boyfriend, I forget everything. Else. Like, <laughs> I just, there was a lot that I didn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird that like they never really lean into that too much. And I think, I remember talking to uh, Casey Hudson about like the origins of the game, of the name and like them spitballing different names and they realized that like eventually it just needs to, it's never going to make a lot of sense. Like Star Wars is objectively a stupid combination of words. And I think Mass Effect <laughs> is, is like, <laughs> or is well, it great? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it is. But like Mass Effect has risen to that level where you don't really stop to think about just like, oh yeah, I guess. It's just, it embodies so much more than, you know, a scientific principle in the world of the Mass Effect universe. Like, who cares? Mass Effect just feels like space. If you've never, if you have no yes. idea what the game is, it's some space sounding words. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's a great name. Uh, Leo... Leo, little baby, boy, Leo. What? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. What did you think of this first section of the game? I'm just curious, like, mm. what, what hits you? Look, I'm always the contrarian. I know oh! everybody's listening with bated breath. Is yeah. Leo going to like it so that it's okay that I like it too? Uh huh. And the answer is, I like it a lot. I like it a lot more than my first playthrough for sure. I think the combat is kind of exactly how I remember it, which is too bad, but I'm more into like, the characters, what's going on, and the setup for everything that makes the combat a bit more engaging because I care about like what I'm on my way to. Do you think that's just because you're trying to focus on it for the deepest dive, or you're just in a different, smarter headspace now, or what's the difference? Got a lot smarter. Okay. I think it's <laughs> the fact it looks nicer for sure, playing it on a bigger TV. And yeah, the fact of this deepest dive for sure making me have no choice but to give it my complete attention. It's as giving me as much as I'm putting into it. Yeah. Do you feel like um, you're overwhelmed by the amount of lore thrown at you at this point? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, could you? I mean, I'll say at the very end of this segment because we're playing till we leave the Citadel. The sheer amount of things on that galactic map. Oh, I'm boy. second guessing if we have enough time this year to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we can do it. It's not so bad. But like, I'm curious about the lore stuff. Like, this isn't me pointing fingers, fingers or anything, but. Like, do you know the difference between a Salarian and a Sari and a Turian? Like, do you have that locked into your brain yet, or is it all just kind of a blur? It's somewhat. I know, yeah. I know what Turians are and the Sarians are. <laughs> all right. Hey, yeah, very that's nice. pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. the game does such a good job, and maybe it's just because it's been baked in across the trilogy, but it's like, I think it does such a good job for just being very clear, being subtly complex, I think is the right way to put it. Where it's just like, hey, here's these handful of different alien species. Here's kind of the stereotype about them. Hope you get the idea. And here's the dynamics go. And it, in my mind, replaying it now, I just feel like it sets everything up so beautifully. Even if you don't go into the codex, it's like, this is what you need to know about these different races. And you kind of understand what they're working with archetypally, if that's the word. The world building yeah. is phenomenal. Like yeah. you have so many problems with sci-fi series and fantasy series of like, we have all of these specific proper nouns to introduce you to. And how do we say that? in the first chapter without it feeling like an exposition dump. And this game never felt like that at all. It always felt like you were just there and you knew everything you need to, and you're still learning interesting things the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel Ben, like I, my, what struck me replaying this in a way that had never quite struck me before was exactly what you're, what you're talking about. The idea that like on some level, if you give someone a, you're a space Marine in a sci-fi space world, there are, there are a lot of gaps that I think players fill in automatically with that, right? Like, okay, there's going to be evil aliens. We're going to be flying around on a starship. We're going to have space guns and space armor and, you know, mm -hmm. like the various things like that. So I think on some level, part of the job from a storytelling perspective that I think BioWare does so well with Mass Effect is in those first few hours to say, okay, you're 
you're assuming some, you're starting with some assumptions about what this game is just based on what we've given you. Now we're going to tell you what's different. We're going to tell you why Mass Effect is unique and what about our world you need to pay attention to specifically. And I think that opening thing saying, boom, Mass Effect is the, is the first one. But then it's like, you pay attention to, uh, you pay attention to, what the hell is that? To, I had to readjust in my chair. Sorry. I see. I see. Uh, like the, the big beats they hit in those first, in those first, uh, story moments that start unfolding is yes. the, the idea of like, like, uh, okay. Specters. That's one of the first things they talk about is Nihilus the Spectre. And then they, then there's like Geth and Geth and stuff going on down there on the, on the planet. And then that's one of the things that, uh, they start talking about like AI and AI's place in the world. And, uh, the way they introduce the other alien species, I think this is a weird thing too, but the fact that one of the first aliens you meet is Nihilus, a Turian. Yeah. And one of the second aliens you see is Saren, a Turian also. The idea of like, okay, Turians are common, but they're different from each other. Like you need to learn how one might be different from another. And it's like these sort of like subtle bits of kind of uh, in-universe vocabulary building, visual and actual like words, to give players a foundation that the game can build on not just in one game, but in multiple ones after that too. Absolutely. And like that doubling up of Nihilus being a specter is so smart because then every conversation you have running around the Normandy in the beginning is people talking about like their frustrations with specters, the mystery surrounding the specters, also their frustrations with Turians and the first mm -hmm. contact war. It's just like, it is so efficient for just setting up all that stuff out of the gate. It's, it's incredible. I turn this into a Nihilus cast because, Love oh him. my God, he's so, <laughs> and shout out from voiceover, representative voiceover, represent, but Alistair Duncan is an amazing voice actor. Most folks probably most recently know him from God of War. He's dude on your belt, but um, oh, he's just, he's, he's wonderful. And, um, and the way, the subtlety and your dynamic in those first conversations where he's like, I'm kind of encouraging you. I'm kind of judging you. I'm kind of condescending to you, but I'm yep. kind of, it's just really beautifully calibrated and like kind of puts you on your back foot just a bit um, without pushing you away. And it's, it's amazing. It's, he's so good. And I was like, Oh God, I, I would have, I would have romanced Nihilus in a heartbeat <laughs> <laughs> if we could have kept him around. <laughs> um, he's great. Yeah. But yeah, but um, to your point about just sort of sci-fi and the, and these relationships between the complexity and the inter the dynamics within races and then between races, I am not typically a hard sci-fi. If someone throws their, like, for example, and I love The Expanse now, but it took me a minute to get into The Expanse because I need character hooks. Yeah. Because there was a lot of, like, lore dump and stuff, and I wasn't quite hooking into the characters who really grow over over time. But, like, Mass Effect does such a great job of being like, here are some people that are really flavorful, interesting personalities, and you will be, in your understanding of them and of these dynamics will be enriched if you go to the Codex. You're going to learn some things that's going to make things make sense. Um, but you won't miss like all of that sort of human, the juicy essential part that like the, their priority is on sort of physics between, you know, between people and between, you know, these, these bodies, these communities, and all of that will be palpable. It'll track, it'll be interesting. And you'll just sort of go back and forth between learning more in the codex and seeing more and feeling more from the people. And you'll, but I never felt left behind as someone who needs to care about who's in this space before I care about your world building. Um, it's just all there and it's all helping each other. It's yeah. brilliant. And I, th I think, yeah, just not, not go too far back in time, but yeah, just that all you all the setup you need is explaining the Mass Effect mass relays and stuff for understanding humanity's place in the world. But yeah, it just, it's so great that it doesn't start with a wall of text saying, okay, a thousand years ago, this race of aliens and this race of aliens. Like it introduces the races by character first, not name first. Yeah. And it's such a small distinction, but it, it makes the world a difference. Um, yeah, that's like the, the PS2 RPG problem back yes. in that era. It was just like that scroll <laughs> at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah Zach, I and, and, you know, it's novel, but I'm, I don't care yet until you show me people who's, who they will be impacted by this world building that I am invested in. Yeah. So. I just wanted to, to call out one little detail that I like too, and that's the idea that, so like you choose your different backgrounds, right? Like are you a spacer or a colonist or are you a war hero or, or all that stuff? And I remember when I first played the game, in terms of like feeling invested in Shepard as a character, mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I first played the game, it felt like I remember thinking like it's kind of stupid and artificial that you just make these selections in the character screen and then it immediately cuts to, you know, Shepard looking out the window and Anderson and Udina and Hackett being like, well, what about Shepard? 
She's a spacer. She grew up on spaceships. Ah, yes, also a war hero. And at the (laughs) time, I was like, this is so stupid and transparent. You are just reiterating what I just said, what I just said. But even now, going back to it, it it feels smarter to me in the way that it's just a, a nod, like BioWare's nod to say, look, the things you are doing and choosing will matter. You will see those things referenced. Even if it doesn't, even if those choices don't ultimately like, you know, is, aren't the first domino in this elaborate series of them. It's still a way of seeing your input represented. And I thought that was smart too. Yeah. And this is kind of related to that, but it, it reinforced that same idea. Um, when you have the conversation with the dock worker on Eden Prime and he's relaying what he saw and, and you know, Saren versus Nihilus, all that stuff. Ah, the coward. <laughs> the notorious, yeah. my favorite you coward. You can uh, shame for being lazy or not do that, because <laughs> why? Yeah. But then I just love the fact that, like, the council, the most important body in the galaxy is like, yeah, we hear about this dock worker. And it just, like, helped reinforce the idea of, like, oh, every character is going to matter. Like, remember every character that you talk to because it could be really important later on. And I just love that little reinforcement there early on. Um, but let's see. Oh, Kitty Assassin says, the moment that really stuck out to me is the opening section of the very first game uh, when Shepard's looking out the window of the Normandy. It's a beautiful shot in the remaster, especially where the improved lighting makes it so that you can see some of Shepard's face reflecting against the glass. It was a small, simple addition to that scene, but it gives such a cool vibe for the first shot of a spacefaring adventure. Yeah, that reflection's key. Um, Zach Einkier nails it, uh, saying, well... Or does he? He says, The opening of Mass Effect does a great job for setting the sci-fi discovery slash adventure tone. This includes the incorporation of Nihilus. He's the very first alien you see in the game, a Turian with features very different compared to a human, but no one on the ship makes a big deal that he's alien. They care more about the fact that he's a specter sent from the council. I don't know if I agree. Like, one of the first lines of the game is Joker being like, I freaking hate Nihilus. I freaking hate that guy. And they definitely talk about the specter stuff, but I certainly read it, the fact that people are bringing up the first contact war so early on in the game, as there's still a little bit of like these freaking Turians like yeah. lording over us. I think that racism is still there yeah. like, from the way I, I read so. it. I'm Did trying you- to remember, because it's Presley. Presley's on the yeah, Presley's in the CIC. So, I mean, yeah, it, I don't remember if that conversation is active until after you're made a specter. But, like, you can talk to him about it. He's got he's got alien problems. Right. And I don't know how soon, and you know, certainly then, if not before, he'll disclose those to you. And he's actually, he's like, I'm working on it. <laughs> but he's got it. You know, he's got him. He's got that trauma. So, um, but it's, it's right there. Yeah. It's Joe, sweet, you're squinting you know. a little bit saying you think it's mainly specter stuff? It just replayed I, I replayed that intro sequence twice recently right yeah. like on the original one and on the legendary edition and my overwhelming sense of it is even if they're talking about this element of like humans and their unease with aliens mm-hmm. you know, humans were just introduced to aliens like 26 years ago or yeah. something right it's like i think that there's a general unease about that but i i guess i would i'm i would agree that it seems like most of the i hate nihilist comes from the fact that he's a specter getting in their business rather than he's a Turian getting in their business. Yeah. I think partly what I'm pulling from as well is just when they get back from Eden prime, they talk about what happened to Jenkins. Uh, but Jenkins. they're like, there's no moment of like reflection of just like, Oh, Nihilus, he died on the mission. That's a shame. Like it's just yeah. glossed over. You think <laughs> that everyone's sad about Jenkins. No one's talking about Nihilus. That's right. Weird. And is that just because of, the human versus Turian thing, or is that just, eh, he's a specter who's annoying, so we're not really going to even talk about the fact that this huge figure died on this mission, kind well, of, sort of, on our also, watch. and Jenkins part of the crew. That's, that's mm-hmm, true, right? yeah. Uh, Snuff- Shout out to Jenkins. Jenkins is played by Josh Dean, um, who is also Henpecked Ho in Jade Empire, and I heard him in a couple other places. He might be Shells. Like, I started to, now that I've been in this enough, I can, like, hear, because you get three voices per, con- like, in the voiceover contract, you get three voices in a session, so you do a lot of multicasting, typically. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so you can always kind of listen. You're likely to hear someone hired from, from multiple places, in multiple places, if that's a fun game you want to play. Um, but Josh Dean has directed me a ton on Anthem, so he's done a lot of directing for them um, since then. So shout out to Josh Dean. He's a wonderful red shirt. <laughs> there we go. Yes. What a gem. Uh, it's very funny you phrase it that way. Joe Chefchinsky also submitted a comment on Patreon saying, shout out to the stockest of stock characters, Corporal Richard Jenkins. If it isn't plainly obvious that this doofus is going to die like a chump from the first moment he opened his mouth, yeah, sticking funny. his low poly mug into the squad menu, even though he had not been a part <laughs> of any marketing, should have been the next major hint. Imagine how different this legacy could have been 
Imagine how different his legacy could have been if he hadn't blindly stepped in front of a Geth laser blast for no reason. Even the condolences yeah. dispensed by the crew in the Normandy after the mission are hilariously abrupt and emotionless. <laughs> Message is clear. This is a character who was designed to be forgotten. Well, that's a shame. Although Taylor yeah, Owen... A lot of lore, like lore, he does some heavy lore. Like his, that back and forth is, the, is an essential because he's the only one who's kind of excited about a Spectre being on board. So him talking with Chakwas and everyone around him does a lot of like that sort of setting the different factions and kind of setting the situation. Um, yeah. Also, can, can Shepard definitively is like, great, go ahead. And John Jenkins <laughs> walks out and gets shot. So maybe we should be taking a little bit more responsibility for that? Yeah, I don't know. You're totally right, yeah. Taylor Owens writes and he says, Jenkins' death, Jenkins death is 100% Shepard's fault, right? Shepard motions for him to move up like he's being tactical, but makes no attempt to give covering fire when Jenkins moves out in the open and gets shot. And then the middle dialogue option is basically, soldiers die, let's move on. It's a very strange way to open a game about being a leader. <laughs> well, I guess that's true. Uh, but well, Joe, it, it means go die. <laughs> <laughs> Sacrifice yourself, please. Wait, Jenkins is actually doing it. What the hell? <laughs> no, you fool. Uh, yeah, Joe. Oh, uh, Joe Chafinsky <laughs> also uh, commented that in the conversation you mentioned there, Sarah, that he said that uh, Jenkins has his favorite line in the entire trilogy, where Jenkins, or, yeah, where Jenkins just says, wow. "That's Spectre justice." <laughs> Real quick, he's talking about the Spectre. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Oh. I'm now just picturing a mo- like a full length movie of Training Day with Jenkins and, and Ethan Hawke <laughs> <laughs> and Nihilus. That would be so good. Oh, that would be fun. I also I don't know if Bioware ever confirmed this, but it's Richard L. Jenkins. Right. And the actor. Think, well, but I think <laughs> that the L, there's speculation anyway, that it's Le- L for Leroy. Right. Leroy Jenkins uh, from that old famous WoW, that WoW video where he just shouts Leroy Jenkins and gets destroyed. I think but that's right. Sense. I think that's right. Um, yeah, is this too much of a stretch? I wonder if Bioware's ever talked about like Ashley Williamson, right? Williams. Is that, Williams. Williams. Is that a homage to Evil Dead with Ash Williams? Or is that... Just a weird outlier. Joe, did you write that character's name? Could you confirm or deny that, please? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, man. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, Matthew Roberts here uh, is backing us up. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew is saying, the setup of the world characters and overall narrative in the first few hours is so much stronger than any of the storytelling in two or three. Um, yeah, I think one, I love one just because it's so focused. Um, I love Saren as just like a nice central yeah. villain. I think... Definitely, you know, the pacing of this section is a little all over the place, but I think just having that focused mission, uncovering the mystery of the world and specifically Saren's plot, I think just moves things along so well. You know, obviously things get bigger, things get more dire, but I think it conceptually moves a lot here. It's, you know it's got I, the strongest A plot by far. And right. And a great villain. Right. So it has a lot going for it. And yeah. the villain has a sweet theme. Just that do 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 yeah. Oh, it's so sweet. The it's a like, game over theme. Oh, yeah, it's the so over cool. Theme. All yeah. game over music should be the villain music. It's like, hey, this is their time to celebrate. They want to they dance won. to their own music. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, on, a little bit on, on, that, on that point, though, I think that Mass Effect as a trilogy reminds me a little bit of, have you guys read the Hunger Games or seen the Hunger Games movies? Yeah. Because there's, there's this sense of, like, in the Hunger Games, just talking about keeping it focused for that first game, right? Yes. To sort of, like, introduce the world and the way it works. The Hunger Games does something similar, where it's like, like, you are focused on this one character, some of the people she encounters, and the idea of, like, winning this game. But then, as the series goes on, it sort of expands more into, you know, like, the, the larger world and the concerns there. And... I don't think it's spoilery from a Mass Effect trilogy standpoint to say like you've got you've got Saren and your mission you like to hunt him down as the focus in the first game, but it's not like there's Saren Part Two in Mass Effect Two, right? Like like the your your scope the scope of the story and your responsibility sort of broadens as the series goes on. Also, yeah. Uh, to, to my mind, Mass Effect 2 has kind of a, a more of a book-like or a television structure. I'm, totally. I'm sure I'm not the first person to say that. I'm almost 100% sure, but I can't remember who. But yeah, that that, that rhythm feels very different and episodic and just sort of, it, I think it just to feel, it feels, it's a different kind of experience. So I, I, they're a little bit apples to oranges as far as how they're built, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, Will Dane submits a comment over on Patreon saying, Mass Effect's first <laughs> yes. act uh, pulls a lot from hard-boiled detective noirs. Does it take one dirty cop to catch another? If you choose to flaunt the council's rules, are you any better than Saren? This all fits really well with the good cop slash bad cop dialogue wheel in the game. Uh, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, Neil Smith, well, there's a lot that we could unpack here. Uh, maybe we won't jump right into all that stuff so far. But the dialogue wheel? You want to talk about the dialogue wheel? We're going to unpack the dialogue wheel? I mean, it seems like a good spot, a good lead into it. And that is like, I think one of the, one of the big things. I don't know, like, I, I want to know what Leo's impression of that is. Yes. Like, it's... yeah. What do you think, Leo? Do you like the dialogue wheel? And have I you do. figured, have you figured out the gimmick in terms of the placement of things on the wheel? Like things on the left are kind of less essential and things on the right will move the conversation forward. And That's things up are nice and things down are bad. Yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> Brilliant. <Yes. laughs> Nailed it. I, this I, guy gets Mass Effect. Coming off of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, it's like, wow, when have I played a game with this deep of dialogue? Like, you have so many choices in every conversation, and I feel like I haven't gotten that out of a game in a long time. It's, like, still better than so many contemporary games for that. Yeah. It's really interesting, because I remember when we came off of Dragon Age Origins and just the, the burden on, like, the dialogue wheel took a lot of options off the table. So it was like, yeah, what, what are we used to? Now it's more complex. And then, then we were like, where's all of it? Like, you know. And voice, just the challenge of voicing it. Also, just that we didn't have a, a character, unless I'm forgetting somebody, voicing all of those, um, voicing branching dialogue in that way and trying to sound like one person until this moment. To my mind, that's the first time a, a protagonist had to, an actor had to carry that job, um, mm. voicing all that. I remember it was a big deal. Everyone was like, will they be able to pull it off? Like, <laughs> this person sounding not like multiple personalities? Um, yeah. And, and yeah, she does it. Uh, Tanner Hoisington <laughs> says, what I love about this trilogy all revolves around that Bioware dialogue reel. Uh, wheel, what's better than walking around the Citadel, talking to these alien species, getting extra lore when I want to, being a space jerk when I want to. Yeah, and Aaron yeah. T uh, submits a comment, very relevant, saying, Bioware actually patented the Mass Effect dialogue wheel in 2006, and the patent is still active today. It's shown up in Dragon Age 2 and Inquisition, but it belongs solely to Bioware. On top of that, the patent is, sneaky, is sneakily written to not specify shape. So other developers can't use a similar system with a square or a triangle. Don't even try making a dialogue square, everybody. We know you want to. <laughs> Didn't, That's I mean, I know for sure that Alpha Protocol used something that was very similar to the Mass Effect wheel. So yeah, they somehow was, got around that. Yeah. Alpha Protocol. I wonder, because that was, yeah, 2010, I think. So, yeah, that's confusing. Um, Aesir Lord Thor... Uh, has a bone to pick about some of the voicing for the main character here, saying, I've got some gripes with the role-playing aspect. The prompts they give you often bear no resemblance to what your character actually says. Sometimes the renegade options work well, like when I was confronted by the manual uh, laborers at that club and got them to back down by saying, I've just killed 50 bodyguards. What do you think I? What do you think you can do? But Such a great line. <laughs> but other times, you sound like a goofball. After being appointed a specter, I chose the dialogue option, About Time which I thought was referencing the fact that humanity has been stifled by the council and Anderson missed out on becoming a specter because of Saren. Instead, my shepherd said, I've been waiting for this since Eden Prime. And I was like, what? That was only like an hour ago. <laughs> I think this is exacerbated by uh, how it's very unclear what exactly Paragon and Renegade actually are, and they might as well be labeled nice and mean. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, the fact that I'm not trying to be too strict about the way I'm playing my shepherd hasn't resulted in me having any of those panic moments of like no 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 not quite yet Security. um yeah it's yeah. like oh that's a slightly different read than i was expecting that direction to go but it's not exactly full la noir of feeling <laughs> like a night and day difference or something you know yeah so there's a problem with that approach though oh and this is something like i i really i really do like role-playing uh a character if it's something that makes sense within the context of the of like Okay, here's what I guess I'm getting at is I hate it when games like Mass Effect, this first one, penalize you for like kind of staying in the middle, right? Yeah. Like if, and because this is how my very first playthrough of Mass Effect was like this. I did the like, I'm just going to do what I feel like. Mm -hmm. And what Joe felt like in 2007 ended up with a character who was basically half Paragon, half Renegade all the time which meant that I never had access to the really cool stuff that either side can do. So you don't get, there's, there's no neutrality benefit. Yeah. And this I, is the I, same, I relate to that. Yeah. It's the same problem that uh, you run into. I mean, it's sort of a carryover from the pre Bioware's previous era of like KOTOR, the sort of yep. good and evil stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That I feel like they didn't, they, they address it later on in the series, this idea of, you, you basically choose before you begin 
are you going to be Paragon or Renegade? And you just stick that through because if you don't, you just end up not being able, you, you end up losing out on content, which just I, feels like a design oversight to me. I don't, I don't know, know about losing out on content though. Like I remember it specifically with KOTOR, like I was that problem of being in the middle. I'm like, well now I don't get like force lightning or anything cool, but like Mass Effect, other than like- one spectrum and you only moved this way and this way. You couldn't get points in both things. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Um, but yeah, for Mass Effect, I mean, there's obviously huge things that can happen, but um, I mean, I didn't see it unless I'm misremembering something as like a complete deal breaker that I'm missing out on like cool abilities in a huge way. It's just like, it just seems like a more interesting path to have like different consequences for your choices for riding that middle line. I think that's the, the question is whether or not it's like a design just like, cause the people argue that Witcher makes cuts you away from content based on choices you make of how you navigate the game and you're just going to miss out on it. So whether or not that's like, an oversight or a loss or it's like oh you don't you didn't lean hard into that i mean i'm tempted to agree with you i'm devil's advocating here <laughs> but like that you know if you're like oh i i don't get to finish this i don't get to resolve this conversation in the most extreme way because i didn't earn that and you're like well that's my that's my experience there's other things i probably got like a level two intimidate that i wouldn't have gotten in this playthrough in the context of this playthrough if i had leaned all the way into paragon or something but but i'm inclined, inclined to agree with you that, that more I guess instrumentalized with how you feel and how instrumentalized it has, your experience has to be, um, you know, to reward nuanced play that's like all over the map and kind of in, in spontaneous and everything. Yeah. 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 I, I, oh, Joey, I see you not wanting to spoil stuff, but I mean, are there like really <laughs> yeah. abilities that you unlock? Like, does it affect gameplay in a big way? So here's, I, I guess, I two things. Two things I want to say. One thing is that. I think I probably wouldn't even mind so much if you didn't see the grayed out options that you cannot <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Like if you Fair. just wouldn't show them to me, it wouldn't right. bother right. me. But yeah. I feel that's like, and uh, you know what? And my other point is something that's, just, that is too, too far down the road. So yeah. I'm just not going to mention it. Sure. On the other hand though, there is like the Citadel quest where there's the preacher that needs the permit and they're in that dispute. And I know that like either of them, I could charm or intimidate if I had enough points in that, but I don't. So I just leave them in their dispute for a few more hours. <laughs> I'll come back someday and hopefully help them. Oh, funny. Yeah, that was one where, you know, I'm generally trying to be good, but this was one where I'm like, nope, I'm totally with that Turian c -Sec guy. Like, Canary, you got to shut up, man. Like rules <laughs> are the rules. Like shut this <laughs> down immediately and it was kind of fun to play it that way anybody buy my permit i bet i'm a permit oh, okay just me why no. I, I, <laughs> I took, i'm open to it i took the leo approach where i went up to him and was like it showed me the options grayed out so i was like well i'm just going to come back when my intimidate's high enough and i can intimidate but that's the other frustrating thing is that because of the way this the skills are capped as you progress it's like i had all yeah. i had maxed out my intimidate for what it could be at that level and it still wasn't enough to get him to move i had to become a specter first mm. and then it opened up a few extra slots that i could go and throw at him but yeah. was the game just teasing the feature without anyone being capable of <laughs> using it at that stage yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, that's possible too i guess so uh yeah sean bills wrote in saying that was their favorite quest the most interesting quest was that hanar permitting thing which is, is <laughs> fun, very specific <laughs> detail um back to eden prime um austin asked writes in saying i love how ridiculous some of the renegade options are when you first arrive on eden prime there are those two scientists that are locked up in a building one of the scientists is crazy and will blabber nonsense shepherd will literally just punch him to shut them up as one of the renegade options Say good night, Manuel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't you do that, John? Yeah, I absolutely did. Yeah, yeah. you did. It's yeah. classy. Yeah, John G you said, know. "Whoops, a Daisy." Going... Didn't see it coming. Anybody else clock this guy? Yeah, Joe did there for you, John. And going back to the, the a little bit of the voice actor discussion, real quick. I think it's I I think it's really interesting actually how over time I think people generally refer to Jennifer Hale's performance as like, "Oh, that's Commander Shepard." Whenever someone talks about like Commander Shepard's voice performance, it's like, oh yeah, she did a great job. <laughs> right, right. And, and like, I, I don't, I, I guess I feel like, I think Mark Mir, the, the male Shepard, gets a little bit of short shrift there because as I'm playing through Renegade with him, I think that he is a better Renegade Shepard. Ooh, interesting. Interesting. 
Um, just, I mean, just because his delivery on that line in particular, the say good night, Manuel, <laughs> is so perfect for when he for when he clocks him. And then there's, well, there are lines coming up later later too that I think he just, in terms of just coming off as that, just a bit of a dick. Yeah, I think I think he pulls that off and. This is, of course, nothing against Jennifer Hale because she is my sort of headcanon shepherd, and uh, you know, and I think she does a great job with the range of it. But if you if you are really wanting to go renegade shepherd, if that's your style, I would recommend the male shepherd. I hear you. Like, they're really interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There are definitely times where. It, when I choose the renegade option, it just feels like, okay, this feels like a silly character. Not that, I don't know how much of that is just because I'm so used to a certain image of Shepard in my mind versus like the specific line read or something. But like, you know, with the reporter, <laughs> uh, I, I gave her the info, then it's basically grabbed her by the collar, like, give me more money for this info, which I thought would be wow. funny. I'm like, yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. It just was one of those things like, all right, this is clearly not my Shepard, but I'm rolling with it just because I would like some more money and I don't think I'm obligated to give you this info. Do your freaking job yourself, man. I think yeah. that's a really interesting point about Mark's performance because I think there there is that that said this then the what people say is that Jen has covers this range and makes it consistent at the same time and that's that's kind of one of the iconic pieces of it. But yes, but you're right. Like I haven't heard someone make that case that like cuz his voice is a little dry. It's a little more just as a performance and it's a little um and it's a little maybe I don't know, inscrutable is the wrong word, but if you're playing an inscrutable dick, <laughs> then that's <laughs> perfect. So I like that as advocating for different I think I, as someone <laughs> who has been on the, the receiving end of like, people can just A, B my performance in a role, which is a unique, yeah. like, which is better, you can know, because mm. you can choose differently, which is no other actor does that, where they're like, I could just, I could just choose the better person who who also got cast. So um, I would like to believe that there's, that, that players and myself and the way that I can think and that f- folks can think is of choosing slightly alternate universe versions of this in a way that's meaningful and viable both ways. Like I, I think Ray's, um, freelancer is, is sort of like a little more jovial, a little more like, you know, roguish and mine tends to take things as like, you know, it was maybe a little more serious. Maybe I'm the renegade freelancer. I don't know. But like, <laughs> you know, I think I love that. I like that people, this, these games are about, um, are about variety and kind of alternate timelines, versions of things. And so if we think generously about the performances in them as part of that, I think that's nice instead of dividing into camps and kind of like saying that one's, you know, one's bad or something. Yeah. Um, so and I'm here for that. No, forgive me uh, for not remembering this directly, but I mean, were there kind of the equivalent of Renegade and Paragon options in mm-hmm. Anthem? Did you have to do like multiple versions and try and in your head have that make sense? Or are you just kind of following the director and, and trust their instincts? I'm not sure that there was a, like a, again, it was like in your menu of like how many points of a good person, are you a Girl Scout mm-hmm. or you, you know, whatever, right, but there were right. definitely options that were more or less sensitive, shall we say. That you could use in conversation with people, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I also was thinking about, like, how do I make this person sound like a... It was the same challenge of, like, how do I make this person a consistent human being um, despite different choices that you may have made? Yeah, mm-hmm. and this is an impossible question, but you think that's largely on the actor or largely on the director to try and slot those in? Equally both. I think as an actor, you have to understand the the, the challenge, like, what it means, and maybe you have... Play, I mean... You know, Ray and I both play games. I think that um, Jennifer doesn't hasn't doesn't necessarily played to tons of games, but she just intuited, understood what this thing was in front of her that I think would be baffling to most actors. Yeah. Um, and she did really well. And I think Mark is a, is a gamer, so um, so I think it helps to kind of understand. You know, because I've worked with actors who don't on you know in performance capture who don't have the same background, and they're like, "What does it mean that the scene is branching? I just said something. What is happening?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it can really help to be like, "Oh, all right, I reset to this point in the conversation. All right, okay." And I would move that way. Um, but I rely, at, you know, in anything, certainly um, one in games, because you have no idea what's going on. The director is the one with the game in their head and you are like blind and they're your flashlight. So you're always kind of relying on a director. But especially for that, you're like, am I sounding in the pocket? Am I sounding, is this our neutral zone and we can go up to here and here? Is this our channel? What are we doing? Um, I think you're always reliant on that. But it certainly helps to have a sense of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, in the realm of impossible questions, I was thinking about this and I don't, Okay, I, there's a lot going on here. But I was thinking about it while starting up this game about just like definitely within the last uh, five years or so, it seems like actors have tried to play characters that are their race, right? And I know like Laura Bailey in particular was like, hey, I regret 
playing Nadine in Uncharted uh, 4 and Last Legacy. Like, and in retrospect, not, not the greatest move. Mm-hmm. Is there ever a conversation amongst voice actors about, like, customizable characters? Because, like, Jennifer Hale is voicing a black woman for Mass Effect for me, and it's like, well, that's not on her. It's not like she messed up. But has it ever been a discussion in your field about, like, is there something odd about that? Who should be the voice when you can be any type of character here? I think the question is just who, what do we assume is a default sounding voice? So it's like, no, it's not on Jen if you make a character of a different race, but right. why would we always cast a white person as a default voice per se? Right. I think that's where you start to ask the question. It's like, yes, we enter, there's no, get, no getting around that you're going to have these options and we want those. But always defaulting to X, Y, or Z is maybe where you start to be like, mm. you know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. In a similar way to in this game, it's like, well, they want the sexy alien race, so it's going to be the very female Asari. It's like it's the defaults, I think, from a societal perspective are mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, um, but that's a great question because it's a unique gamesy challenge. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, Snufkin submits a comment on Patreon saying, I like how Nihilus is all cool, like I move faster on my own when he's about to exit the Normandy. Then he leaves in the most casual jog ever and proceeds to die 20 minutes later like a pro. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he was trying his best. My favorite thing about that Nihilus death is I think it's subtly super effective that they have just like Saren taking the gun to the back of his head, but he doesn't fire the shot. They then cut back to you in gameplay, and then it's when you're running towards him, then you hear that shot. Like, it's such a smart way to connect you a little bit more instead of just cutscene gameplay, cutscene gameplay. Um, Yaro here... That scene, oh, yeah. that scene in particular... I noticed in the uh, legendary edition, to me, that was the, that scene always has texture pop in. That was yes, the word on the does. old version, right? On the yes. old version, that's the one where it's like, like Nihilus is sort of leaning up against something and that's always where his armor takes a second to pop in and something. Behind. So like seeing that scene happen without any pop in felt right. wrong to me. I was like, <laughs> wait, is that, hold on. It's, it's all there right away. His armor is all set. That's why Saren hated him so much he had to kill him because he didn't like <laughs> these weird things defying the rules of physics. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, That's Yar- a wild callback that is now that you say it suddenly very visceral. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that always happens the then. Uh, wow. Yaro has a take here and I'm curious if you experienced it this way, Leo. Uh, Yaro says, one of the best parts is the twist at the beginning over Nihilus. People are leery of Nihilus and his demeanor and wonder why the mission needs his firepower, firepower if it's a simple mission. You're then given the valid reason of Prothean tech and a reason to trust him with recommending Shepard to the Spectres, but then you meet crazy Dr. Manuel, who says he sees a Turian prophet, leader of the enemies, and you're right back to thinking it's Nihilus. After you leave that area, you see the cutscene where you meet Saren and he kills Nihilus and the whole all the pieces of the puzzle come together. Um, this exceptional opening does such a magnificent job of getting you invested in seeing where the story will go. But did you experience it as that twist, Leo, where you thought like, okay, clearly they're building up for Nihilus being the bad guy. Oh, wait, no, turns out there's another Turian. Uh, I wasn't really looking at it with a fresh face because I played this part before and because I've heard the word Saren so many times in my life. So that's <laughs> right. Judge that objectively. <laughs> Is that Saren, painful you know? to walk through the world and have people refer to Saren all the time? And you're like, Ugh, I, don't, I don't care. I don't know that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Stop talking about Saren. <laughs> The way you do. <laughs> Your girlfriends are giving a real Saren right now, dude. And you need to learn what that is. <laughs> is that good? <laughs> do you think, um, on that note, Leo, look, we're courting Mass Effect fans in a big bad way to watch The Deepest Dive. Uh, thank you for your support and for submitting so many comments. But at the same time, do you feel like Mass Effect fandom has kind of turned you off from the series? Because it is potent. Oh, I okay. think that is just something that I'm... Uh, vulnerable to with certain franchises but i have not gotten that from this community at all except with occasional like uh garris lust like <laughs> we'll call it all right we'll hang up on I you now Sarah. My- <laughs> <laughs> it's something that i've just never you know been able to connect with and i hope that's something i'm healing with this project right I always just think of, I remember Jeff Cork back at Game Informer, him being just perplexed by the Garrus lust. And he's like, I don't understand. Like, all these people on the internet are just talking about Craven Garrus's cricket dick. <laughs> that, that combination of words will never leave my brain. 
I have never heard that in my life, and I feel scandalized. <laughs> I'm sorry. So you don't listen to them. Honey. I understand. You have a classy <laughs> approach to Garrus. I understand. You're in it for his brain. We understand, Sarah. Well, what, no yeah, it's true though. He, I mean, like Emmy One Garrus is like, you know, he's in a, he's he's on a journey, a different journey. He's an adolescent almost, you know. And so, like, it's I don't I don't know. Maybe folks are horny for Garrus now, right out of the gate. But I, I wasn't horny for Garrus until we spent lots of like really meaningful quality time together on the Normandy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like a real. And then that's what makes Mass Effect 3 this wild thing is that that history is so is made of these tiny little details and accumulates really beautifully. But it's not something that smacked me in the face right away. Yeah. And exactly. I hope by the end I'm yeah. hornier than anyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Dude, here's a like, chitinous exoskeleton just like going up and hey. like, s- smooch is like kissing t- a tree bark. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole conversation how that's going to work these are long conversations for multiple party members in Mass Effect 2 right it's how is this going to happen mm. I, mm-hmm. look this is my a, mouth is all sappy now <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not a spoiler for Mass Effect 2 but uh, I, I was tempted to court Garrus the first time I played through the trilogy and then I got to the point in Mass Effect 2 where like he came over and brought flowers and I really had that moment of like yeah, never mind. I don't really want to do it. And it'll like break his heart in that moment. And now like my canonical moment is just like my character really thinking about like, I like Garrus. I think I can do this. Then just mean like, ah, sorry. I'll, so I'll keep the flowers. He's an though. awkward little baby. Oh no. Yeah. That's he, he's really a tragic figure now. Oh, dear. Um, I'm curious for Leo as, as someone, even though I guess this is stuff that you've played before. At this point, what characters in the party? Because we have mm. all of our parties, save for one person at this yeah. point. Like, who who do you like? Who do you want to roll with? I do like Garrus as a character at this point. Ah, uh, yeah, I get it. <laughs> God, God help me! At this point, I can't remember all the names. Who's the lady assassin? Okay. Tally. Assassin. Tally. Yeah, I don't know assassin? assassin. I mean informant person the, the one in the scuba suit she's like an amish <laughs> i mean she i don't know about assassin but yeah the scuba she, person yeah she's on her <laughs> all right are yeah, you playing yeah. mass effect 2 leo <laughs> oh <crap. laughs> right yeah <laughs> all right because you yeah. wouldn't know her <laughs> <laughs> okay what do you uh, like clearly i love her i just get yeah, like, <laughs> think she, everything she's about is so cool <laughs> <laughs> mask masked right yes mask yeah right great uh what stands out about Tally, was it just like her her setup or just her look or what is it? Both, yeah. Her introduction was cool. It was immediately like, well, I feel nothing about these other humans that are my options, so I'll bring her along. Yeah. And then it's like the problem I always have in these games of, well, I'm always going to be more interested in these two now since I've been with them for so long and I know them better. Like, why would I switch at any point? And we'll see if I do. Well, that's an interesting point. Yeah, because Rory Sublet submits a comment saying, the squad member is one of the best parts of the Mass Effect games, and this one really starts you with two duds. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. Uh, Tarek Telpod writes in and said, I'd forgotten both how boring I felt Caden was and how low-key racist Ashley is. Without spoilers, uh, he's wondering how we're vibing with each of them. Um, yeah, the classic Caden's a dud debate is live and well. Like, it really stood out to me in this one when <laughs> you get to the Citadel <laughs> and all he says is, big place. Big place. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then what's amazing is then, like, there's a cutscene later on where you're, like, looking over the edge and he says it again, like, big place. Like, that's all he has to say about the Citadel. <laughs> Come on, Caden. I thought Mary Kenny, uh, who who was a writer at Insomniac for a bit and, and Telltale and other places as well, was like do a, a supportive Caden tweet the other day, and I was very felt very vindicated. I mean, I've been in love with Raphael Sparge's voice since Kotor, so so and and if I could romance what who's he footsie from Kotor, I could probably <laughs> then you know I'm in for Caden. Um, so yeah, and I mean just an incredible. He's just like a sensitive. Yeah, I guess this depends on how you deal with awkward, slightly awkward boys. If you if your heart flies out to them, or if you're like, Ugh, then, <laughs> then maybe it's not for you. But someone else pointed out that he like you know he has massive migraines and he manages to be sociable, which is like you know he's dealing with a lot. I don't know. I like Aiden. and I feel and I I this is where my voice actor brain definitely intercedes because Kimberly Brooks is like the nicest, most accessible down to earth human being mm. on the planet. And so like, I can't not hear, I can't not feel, feel for it for uh, Kimberly when I listen to Ashley. Right. And she's just doing, this is, this to me feels like a little bit of troubleshooting of like, how do we make flawed, interesting characters 
And what's the what's the mandate to make them likable or for them to have the right kind of flaws for them to work in this party setting? And this is like this first grand kind of experiment with that. And she, they're like, she's a bit racist. Yes, no. And everyone's like, no, she has to have different problems. And they're like, OK, you know, I feel like. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm sure that, you know, narratively, it's kind of how it all mapped out. But I'm wondering, like, the aliens are all so good and such yeah. great characters. And so I wonder if they were trying to seed into what Leo was getting at of like, let's start you with these two humans so that maybe you'll feel attached to it because we need to get those numbers up for the people that will actually stick with the duds here instead of going to the coolest cast in the world. <laughs> it's hard when the aliens are all so great. Yeah. Right. You were talking about the voice actor for Caden being someone from KOTOR. Who yeah. was, was he? Well, I don't know why my brain is... Was it feuding. Karth? Was it like yeah, the same, Karth. That same archetype. Okay. That's that would so make, funny. Karth. That would make I sense. I was just Googling KOTOR dip to try to remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> and it was an overwhelming Google result. Did it give you Karth Onassi? <laughs> it did that. Hopefully oh, it does wow. now. I'm sure happy about that. Oh, Onassi. Uh, that's, that's sort of... This is like a Bioware archetype, and like I'm, they're mm -hmm. aware That's of this, right? It's yeah. like it's the sort of slightly, I don't know if roguish is the right word, but like gen, like generally the sort of sensitive, good-hearted dude who is gonna stick by you until like unless you do something terrible, and they've got that in like Karth, they've got that in Caden, mm -hmm. uh, in Dragon Age, they've got that with Alistair. Mm -hmm. uh, and even for, like further on in Dragon Age, what's his name? Uh, Cullen is sort of, is basically yep. the same. Yeah, that thing too. You know, so it's like it's, I generally, regardless of the voice performer, just don't vibe with that Bioware archetype. But they keep doing it because I am in the minority, and lots I, of people are love we those. Characters. A gender split along these yeah. lines, perhaps? Sure. <laughs> oh, very perceptive mm. of you. Mm. Could be. Could, could be. be. Yeah. Be. Well, no, I mean, I, 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 I know dudes who like, who like those dudes also, you know, yeah. like there's just something <laughs> just not, not, not for me. Yeah. They're not yeah. bad characters. Yeah. It's, it more exposes right. something within me about who I'm eager to pick on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I guess that's yeah. true. Um, yeah. If, I they, if they had a wedgie button, you'd just give Katie wedgies <laughs> constantly. Oh no. Um, yeah. How dare you. That, <laughs> that base wedgie. Paragon plus 3000. <laughs> that that line in the Citadel too, like I I was confused about this delivery, like you know awkward nice boys is the way you put it, Sarah. And I think it comes through, mm -hmm. especially that line in the Citadel where he's like describing why Shepard is so great, and he's like, "There's no reason yeah. the Council wouldn't pick you to be a Shepherd. I mean, the reason I wouldn't pick you. I mean, it's just like this weird yeah. stretch where like both Ashley and I are just looking. I'm like, I didn't understand what you're trying to say <laughs> right now. <laughs> if you're trying to hit it's on me, just, just please do it. I'll take it. It's rom com. It's pure rom com. You're maybe. right. Yeah. You're right. In my in my pursuit to stick with my mandate and pursue a like a weird shepherd, yeah, I am keeping Caden in my party, which I have yes. never done before. Yes, I yeah. love that. I don't know if I've done that either, actually. And he's super. I mean, like Ben said, he just has really boring things to say most of the time. <laughs> but at least now I know what they are. I love that idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I wear the same class. We're both Sentinels, so I'm so I probably just won't. I'll probably yeah. just stick with Garrison Rex for a bit. Very smart. Interrodus mm -hmm. Mitsukawa on a Patreon asking, could you imagine a game where Caden had seen the vision from the Prothean Beacon and took over Shepard's role? He was robbed. He <laughs> suggested he was robbed. That was like him <laughs> being pulled in for like, this is my moment to shine. Uh, no, I guess not. I guess Shepard has to be the hero. the precipice of becoming interesting and just snatched back. You know? yeah. Does that change, I wonder? Because I thought Ashley was the one who was almost... Oh, really? That depends on your gender. Oh, it, it must be, yeah, it must be Shepard's gender. For me, it was Ashley who almost got pulled into the beacon and Shepard jumped in to save her. Oh, that's yeah. really interesting that they'd swap that just for like the, the yeah. big rescue moment, I guess. Mm -hmm. They're just setting up a gentle hetero assumption there. Yeah. <laughs> you know. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there is, um, there's an interesting point here from who can forget the one, the only... Uh, critical Kate writes in with a very critical question from Kate asking, did anyone else notice that all the women need to be saved from peril when you recruit them, but not any of the guys? So, that's a very interesting thing that I didn't think I noticed, oh, but it, it does kind of check out so far at least. Yeah. That's hmm. interesting. Um, yeah. Noted. The, um, the Prothean beacon. I have a couple questions about this. First of all, they changed the vision, right? Like it seemed like it was more jumbled this time around. 
Yeah. That's a good they, question. Yeah, I, possible. I thought so too, because there's one, there was a very distinctive, like sort of image, I guess I, I can't really even describe it, but there's one image that I associate with that vision that was not there. Like the live yeah. action kind of metal on a hamburger or whatever the hell that is. Exactly. It's something, yeah. Because it will come, it will resonate later. So it sticks there in your brain. That, right. I, mean, feeling, I, I can't, actually can't picture what it is, but that sounds right. Like you should, you should recognize something later on because what? of its placement in the vision. Yeah. And that's the thing is like making it snappier and flashier. It really disconnects me. Not like it was a clear vision before or anything. That's not a radical change, but like, I think it's a problem with the vision overall where I'm supposed to be fully on Shepard's side when she's arguing to the council, like, no, you don't understand. I know the Reapers are coming. I know all about the Protheans. Cause I had this vision. It's like, I saw your vision and it was 16 flashes of the color red. Like, I, I don't understand why you're so passionate about this. Either that or they did, or the, the idea is that Shepard saw more than what you get to see, which is also a barrier between your experience and the, and the character. Yeah, that's interesting. Be. Yeah, like in the long dream or whatever. Because I guess they mentioned like, oh, you seem like you had REM sleep or you're seeing yeah. something. So maybe so it was like just a stretched still, out version. Still, yeah. Yeah. So it, that's interesting. It, yeah, as it is, the vision is, seems less ominous than it was before. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, the other thing I don't understand about the end of Eden Prime is, you know, you, you touch the beacon, you get the vision, then it cuts to Saren. Well, eventually it cuts to Saren and the matriarch. Um, oh, I forgot about as a character. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, she's in here. Um, but it cuts oh, to cool. him, and somebody mentioned in a comment that he basically has the Kylo Ren moment of freaking out, like, what do you mean Shepard got the... But I don't understand... I don't understand what was, why didn't Saren touch the beacon? Like he was right there. He killed Nihilus. The beacon was like 20 yards away. And the next time we see him, he's flying away and he's like, oh, how dare Shepard touch the beacon? I don't understand what was stopping him from like grabbing it. it. Why didn't he get there first? He did? I think, I think he got the information that he needed from the beacon. And it's the idea. Think of it. Think of it. Like, let's say that, that there's a you're, you're a spy and going to a secret meeting place and someone says meet behind the tree and you see the note but the note's still there and then then your enemy also sees the meet behind the tree note right after you so he also got a vision you're saying i don't know if it's straight up the vision but like he got he got something that he needed out of it and i think he understands or thinks that shepherd got something from it that will expose Saren's intent. Well, he should have nuked it from orbit or something. Like, I was so yeah, confused about that. He's mad saying. the beacon was destroyed, isn't right. he? Yeah, he is. Yeah, exactly. So I guess mm. he should have taken it with them, but maybe he's... Lo- I just want one shot of him trying to pick it up, and it's not coming out of the cement. Is that too much or to Or he's just for? standing in front of it, and the beacon's like, not having it. Thank you. <laughs> Next. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pure of heart <laughs> only. Yeah, maybe, maybe that is the idea. Is it some sort of like Excalibur-like thing, and that's yeah. why he was frustrated but <laughs> that's fine with either ashley or caden or you but not <laughs> yeah i don't know exactly how that works yeah. this this part's a little fuzzy to me actually yeah, I, me I don't remember this super clearly it just seems like a weird uh, structure but who knows i'm sure some things were cut at some point along the way um all right major benezia voiced by uh, I, unless i'm making that up isn't it marina sardis yep and from star trek from star trek <laughs> who is she in mm-hmm. star trek She's, uh i'm not a trekkie <laughs> what's her name deanna troy hmm Ms. Deanna Troy. Gotcha. There we go. Uh, mm-hmm. Noah D. Doing an American accent. Perfect. Noah D. comes in here on Patreon, on Patreon with the, the great comment, the, the almighty comment, the big moment that we haven't talked about yet, saying, I'm a huge sucker for the cutscene when you first see the Citadel. Some serious J.J. Uh, Abrams Star Trek vibes. Even though it was before that film. Um, that This cutscene is what sold me on Mass Effect. Like, I didn't have a 360 at the time. Um, and I think part of me was a little bit like, ah. Eh, RPGs on the Xbox. I like KOTOR, but I don't know. And then uh, I was walking through my living room and my roommate at the time was playing through this section. And like when that music hit, I was like, what is this game? I need to play this immediately. This looks incredible. And still, after all this time, like that cutscene still hits me so hard. It's so incredible. Except, except for then Joker immediately making a dick joke and all that going into it. <laughs> all right, that undercuts a little bit of the magic. It's like, we kind of talk about the size of dicks right in this huge moment. When did moment. he make that joke? Because it's like you How see it, and it's like, oh, it's pretty big, isn't it? And then Joker's like, size isn't the only thing that matters, ladies. Be, 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 or some nonsense. It was like, very <laughs> subtle. I can understand why people would miss that. <laughs> What about you guys? Seth Green's you know? under understated uh, 
performance. Yeah. He's really great. He's so good. He's really good. I'm just, I'm just, I, yeah, I'm no shade on, I'm just saying Joker isn't necessarily the most like no, no, no. nuanced no, in his delivery. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, your point stands. Uh, on the, on the point he's also so defensive and it's, it's a coping mechanism and sometimes it comes out a little. That's yeah. true. That he's, he has a more interesting character than you, than you would think at this point. Yeah. Um, Here's but, what bugs me about that cutscene. Yeah, please. Is, so like, like it, it is a cool cutscene, like in a cinematic sense. I always had this really weird disconnect of you're flying into the citadel, you see mm. this central thing, you see these multiple arms, and you get this, you're supposed to get this grand sense of scale of all of the wards and the presidium area and that tower at the center. But your experience of actually navigating the citadel is like definitely <laughs> underwhelming by comparison, I think, right? It's like right. I can go to like three sparsely populated markets. <laughs> and, and and one just like giant white circle that I can run around until I have to decide to advance the story. I guess there's just sort of that gap of like the an expectation that the cutscene sets up versus yes. the reality of the development budget or whatever saying like, ah, oh, so really the Citadel, you can visit this, you know, one four, four thousandth of... <laughs> the yeah. space that it is you know it's also like the ui in the menu doesn't does do no favors because it's like this awkward thing to move around and it's like this big and you're like what is this but speaking of running the thing that makes me most frustrated about navigating is getting winded after two <laughs> seconds you're like you're a goddamn marine what the hell right. come on <laughs> like, what is this? and running is big like i listening to i think it was mass effect two or three listening to jen's panting was like kind of because i only have a running routine because jennifer hill told me i had to be physically fit to voice video games Oh, and so that was like a big awakening for me of being like, that's what a fit person sounds like when they run. Okay, <laughs> noted. Because I would just be like, you know, whatever. So like that sprinting, like, is always <laughs> stuck out of my brain forever. And then I got so frustrated hearing it over and over. And I was like, because I should just be able to run longer. This is driving me nuts. I know, but I like if this is so much running. I like role playing it, though, that it's like, Shepard's dirty secret that like they're this close to becoming a specter but it's like but please don't let them know that I can only run for 15 feet before I need to stop and gasp for breath <laughs> I, I smoke eight packs of space cigarettes a day <laughs> that would be such a cool dirty secret that no one knows about like that's why I can't run <laughs> Yeah, uh, Martin Glowacki here's some of the comment about that saying one thing that really bothers me is the sprinting for some reason sprinting makes the camera bobble as if the cameraman is trying to run and keep up with Shepard definitely activates my motion sickness hoping for an accessibility oh, yeah. patch at some point yeah I was looking through the menu to try and turn that off because I get nauseated pretty easily but luckily mm -hmm. it only shakes for the yeah four seconds while Shepard's running so it's not too much of an issue <laughs> But, but in the original, you couldn't sprint outside of combat at all, right? That's right. They did add it for this one. Yep. So yep. be grateful. You're right. You're right, I didn't Leo. even remember that. Mm -hmm. There's lots of those subtle little things that uh, is oh my secretly God. very helpful. Just they trotting also, around that map. <laughs> Horrible. I can't imagine. I think, the, I think the dedicated melee button is new also. Because I remember in the, really? old, in the original Mass Effect... Uh, in combat, the only way you could melee someone, I think, is by like sprinting into them. Huh. Okay. So the fact that you can actually like actively in Mass Effect One actively whack them with your gun, I think is I think that's new. Yeah. Uh, Did anyone spend time trying to figure out how to reload before remembering that you can't reload in Mass Effect One? Yes. Oh, I, <laughs> oh yeah. And I was like, where's that? Button? This is why I was glad as OBS and not streaming because I was like, where's the reload button? <laughs> yeah. And the problem is, what they put on the reload button is your grenade. Yes. yes! <laughs> You're just grenading all over the place. Yeah. God. Yeah. Uh, Jordan yeah. Holmdell, some of the comment on Patreon saying, "Has anyone else on the panel been confused about the tweak controls? Swapping grenades to the X button on Xbox One has really thrown me off. It was originally yep. on the 360's back button to occasionally hilarious results. After the introduction." Right. Uh, to Odina on the Citadel, I wandered over to the Elcor Embassy next door. After chatting with everyone there, I accidentally drew my weapons and instinctively hit X to holster my weapon. Instead, I frisbeed a grenade at one of the Elcor diplomats, panicked, shouted, Oh no! Sprinted for the door and barely made it out before the bomb exploded. I can't bring myself to return to that place when my head cannon, my bumbling Commander Shepard, accidentally bombed the Elcor Embassy. Good luck explaining that one, Odina. That's, I love that. That's an act of war in that person's <laughs> world. Like, like, Shepard is a war criminal <laughs> who murdered an alien ambassador. <laughs> the Elcor, like the gentle, like easygoing Elcor. That's so funny. Oh, they had it coming. It did occur to me that you like immediately you can go into like 
uh, is it who, who is it? Executor Palin's office and like just hack his computers. Like you just landed. <laughs> yeah, you start taking secrets out of. I wonder why the Turians hate humans. Meanwhile, <laughs> da, 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 yeah. just hacking away. Don't your... mind me. <laughs> I'm just squirting my Omni Gel all over your computer. <laughs> 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 Oh, uh, boy. Ronmar, the only, uh, <laughs> writes in, he says, the original game requires the player to crouch to get into cover. In Legendary Virgin, cover cover is now an auto mechanic that is fairly intuitive in the early going yeah. and hasn't gotten in the way of the insanity difficulty. Ooh, congratulations, Ronmar. I Ron think Mar. I actually expected to, to hit a button for cover, actually, is what my instinct was. Yeah, 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 I think that works out really well. By the way, it really made me laugh. Uh, when you're fighting in the bar, uh, they have, like, uh, bar tables, just like those tall bar tables. And like the enemies were like using those as cover as if it was like full cover, yeah. but it's just like the thin top of the table is the only part. And the rest is like, I'll just shoot your torso. All right, buddy. You it's do like about you. your knees. Idiot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, can I talk about uh, some other changes to the le uh, legendary edition that I really like? We liked? prefer that you didn't. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> could you not? Yeah. It's a Mass Effect podcast. <laughs> Carry on. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Joe. What stands out? <laughs> Uh, okay, so one, the, the biggest change that I think is amazing is the change to sort of like weapon accessibility. Yes. Where in the original version, even though your character, like if you were an adept like I am, or my shepherd is, I am not. <laughs> you can say yes. <laughs> I have trouble drinking gotcha. tea without spilling on myself. <laughs> uh, is that you can basically only, like, like pistols are, are, the class that an adept uses well. Mm -hmm. yep. And then even though you could technically try and pull out a sniper rifle, for instance, there's this sway when you try to use it on the yes. scope that just makes it impossible unless you are like a soldier in the game like tr and like put points in sniper rifles. But in the legendary edition, they basically take, take that requirement out. So I, as an adept, I can pull out my sniper rifle and just like, start getting headshots right away without some ridiculous sway. So really when you're putting points in your weapon specialties, you're improving from baseline functionality rather than going from being terrible to proficient with it, you know? Yeah. I think it's a really smart uh, choice. Yeah. Which, Connor in the comments is, is totally with you. Um, I can't imagine being someone just playing this for the first time and being like, I shot here and it went there and this I'm out, I'm done with this game. <laughs> like that would yeah. have been, you know, it would have yeah. been a real, Buried entry. Well, I mean, one thing that I remember doing a lot is like, like when I played an ad app before in the game, it was like when, when you beat the game and you start a new game plus, it lets you select basically from a bunch of other classes abilities. Right. So it's like the, the ideal way for me anyway, to play Mass Effect one was to have all the biotics, but then select assault rifle as your like bonus skill, because then it's like, Oh, I can, I have all, all the cool biotic powers, but I can actually shoot something in combat. And now you don't have to worry about that. You can just sort of find your play style in a way that feels more natural. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, Aiden uh, says, I played Mass Effect 1 several years ago and started with a sniper rifle. At the first combat encounter, I tried aiming down the sights. It wobbled and swayed so much that it was impossible to use. I had to stick with a sidearm until I could invest points and the skill made my base weapon usable. It always stuck out to me as one of the least user-friendly openings to a AAA game I've played. And I appreciated the combat more as the game went on, but it was definitely a tough start back in the day. Yeah. Yep. And that's... If you haven't played D and D, like that's that's sort of a an a, a relic of RPG design from, you know, a, a Dungeons and Dragons mindset, right? Like if you're a fighter, you have proficiency with light weapons and you know medium melee weapons and ranged weapons, but a wizard can only use simple weapons, and mm, you know, so it's sort right. of a, a nod to that, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Leo, do you have any thoughts on on combat so far? The little you've done so far. I don't want to weigh in too hard until, you know, I get more powers, get more options and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's just the most uh, outdated of anything in this game as far as how it feels. It feels the most like, oh yeah, this was an Xbox 360 game when they were all mediocre cover shooters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It really takes me back to that time. It's just like, there's not a lot of options. All the enemies kind of stand behind their assigned piece of cover and pop out unless you're looking at them and sometimes they don't. I mean, but. yeah, but compared to back in the day where like the big discussion was like, oh my God, Bioware is going so hard for action. Is this even a Bioware game right. anymore? And now it just stands out so much for the opposite reason. It's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. uh, Smiley14 writes in, said, just a quick comment to say, I love this game. 
Uh, I love that this game has the confidence to have only two or three firefights in the opening six hours. Just a whole lot of drama and political intrigue, with combat being secondary. I miss that from a lot of RPGs. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I like I love the Citadel so much because there is so much to do that is just running around and talking and getting involved in all of these little stories. Occasionally there's a fight like the pace of fights in the Citadel is perfect to me. Leo, what question about I guess it ties into the combat a, a bit, too. But like, are you excited when you level up? Like, are you excited to spend your skill points? Like, like what 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 is your feeling when you open up the menu and see that you have skill points to spend? <laughs> well, I don't really get too excited. I feel like one of the other changes they made is that you level like twice as fast, right? So you don't have to new game plus to get max level. Kind, Whatever so it is, it feels like you're leveling up very fast. And so I don't go in the menu every time I level up. And when I do, it's like, oh, I have a bunch of points banked. I'm excited to put them all into charm again. I think they spaced yeah. it out even yeah. more. I think like originally it was one to 60 and now they changed it to yeah. one to 30 so that you aren't. So this is the, is that right? I think the, the slower right. paced version of going into the, your menu, menu for that stuff. Well, was, the, you was, can change in the settings and maybe our settings are different. Well, my question is then, do they keep the same pace and you just sort of max earlier or do they stretch it out, stretch it out to the same? To, that's a, I don't know. I think the it felt like they, I was the, very quickly. The, the idea is that you can max it in the first in one run now is what I read. I thought you could. I, you know, you're I'm right. the expert. <laughs> I will speak on this. Before you <laughs> no, you're right. You could not max. It, it was really hard if, if you could to get to 60 in one playthrough. Yeah. Yeah. But like what they say when you try and select it at the beginning is like the, the progression of skill points is the same. So it's not like, it's not like you're playing old mass effect, but only until level 30, but you get all the skill points as if you were level 60. I think it's just sort of oh. a rebalancing of okay. you get more skill points. I think you get more skill points at every level, but you, there are just like, I think you get like three yes. or four. I think that's yeah. when you right. level yes. up instead yeah. of two. Right. At each level, right? Yes. I think that's the way it works. But I it's still right. it's still a puzzling change to me because it's really just an, an idea of how you're framing your level 20 versus level 40. But if you have all the same skill, skill points and stuff, it's really just sort of a, it's a, a, a what is it, like a smoke screen. It's just a, right, right, right. The numbers game. You yeah. Know. Uh, mm -hmm. Patrick Henderson uh, submits a comment on Patreon saying, anyone else enjoy some of the RPG elements in Mass Effect 1 that got dumped or simplified in the sequels? I enjoy getting new armor, weapons, and upgrades on a frequent basis and trying the different combinations to fit my play style. I know I'm in the minority, but Mass Effect 1 is still my favorite. Inventory management. That's <laughs> my nightmares. Like, yeah, I does not, that was not... <laughs> Yeah. That's my no, no, no. And no. I know they improved the UI for this one, but still, like, that, like, weapon equip screen, even just, like, small stuff in there still stands out so much. Like, when you equip a weapon, like, there's no sound associated with it. It all just feels like, uh, I just want to get in there and rework how all this stuff is laid out, along with a couple other things. Yeah. And they do that thing that Borderlands tries to do a little bit with, with like, give you some sort of, like, brand loyalty, mm -hmm. right? Like, Ah, to the Elkos the yeah. Combine. I love what they put together for me. <laughs> sort of forever. Yeah, that's... Yeah, nice. exactly. But really, it's just like... You just look at the numbers and yeah. see which one gives you the numbers you're looking for. And it's not... Yeah. You know, like... It almost feels like bloated in a strange way. Yeah. That like... You need that many different kinds of armor with seven levels or eight levels or 10 levels of each one. You know, it's like, uh, okay. Yeah. I wish there was an really auto equip for my squad. I don't think there is though. Right. Like I really like that being able to auto level them up. I don't know if you guys are into mm -hmm. tweaking the numbers that much, but when it comes to them, I'm like, I'll worry about my own skills, but for my, for my buddies, let's just auto this stuff. But Joe, you seem horrified at that notion. <laughs> no, I cannot. Auto I, and I don't think I've ever let a game auto level any character for me. <laughs> That's the point of the game. I'm confident saying that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you assign do you assign people to attack certain I mean are you are you big on on squad assignments? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Well, especially if, like especially in Mass Effect when you're I think the biotics are are just yeah. the that's really the fun way to do it. You can play yeah. Mass Effect as a soldier and sort of like do the hey attack my target kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the game really shines, especially in later entries, not spoilery, but it, like they start bringing in this idea of combining powers that Mass Effect 1 doesn't have. But of like, I was so bummed when I realized it wasn't here. Yeah. 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 But 
like later games in the series have this this idea of like primers and detonators where you sort of set someone up with like singular instance so they're floating in the air and then if you you know toss a uh, throw at them it sort of detonates that original power and creates extra damage and stuff so right, right. that gets really important in those other games but you can still do it in mass effect in terms of you can't do the combos, but you can still yeah. order other people. It gets really helpful in a fight where you're like, okay, Caden, use throw on this, you know, Krogan that's rushing me. And then it knocks him out of the way. Yeah. So I do that a lot. Uh, Infinite Soup writes in with the obvious uh, that a lot of people wrote in about, uh, did anyone feel that the layout of the Citadel was kind of confusing? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That is, that is yeah. the other big thing where it's like, I know they can only do so much with this remake uh, you know it's a mess to try and dive back into it, but it's like i just cannot imagine being like a level designer and seeing the way that this is laid out and being able to sleep at night and i think it is like that classic <laughs> example joe of just like oh, yeah, i'm sure the concept art for the citadel was amazing and then when the artist learned from the tech team what they're able to pull off at the time he was like wait what <laughs> we have to have all these different rooms and elevators just to try and maintain any amount of life in this city it's just it all crumbles apart and i really wish they could have rebuilt just this one thing but that's yeah. a mess they were never going to change the layout or anything but i do wish there was more like changes to the map ui to make it easier to yeah. navigate that stuff because just the fact of being in a place i'm confused about and i go into the map and i can't you know zoom out a layer it's only the area that i'm in that's a change I wish they made for sure. Right. Or just small things like I keep hitting back to look at the map and it's like sh sh that weird scuba exhale as they all take out their guns over and over again. Yeah. Like, oh, no, I'm just trying to look at the map. <laughs> Thank you, game. Mm -hmm. The weird thing to me about the Citadel is that it doesn't feel lived in. Like you go into like that space. There's supposedly what's his name? Bar Levon, that mm -hmm. uh, that little uh, uh, agent. Yeah. Back the, here, right? The, the banker, yeah. yeah. You go into his little office, and it's just like, it's just like barren walls with some sort of, uh, like some sort of terminal behind him or whatever. It's like, this is your office? <laughs> it's just like, it looks like, it looks like you set up a, like, like a, a tarp in this corridor or something. And it's just like, yeah, this is my office now. You know, it's almost like, a, it's almost like they're just playing make-believe. <laughs> without want, like, any pictures. actual... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, you walk around CSEC headquarters. It's all just got this sort of, like, like sterile, flat gray everywhere. There's no, like, there's no visual flourish to make these spaces feel like like they are lived in. Like, like they are things that are, like, that they are locations that are important to people. That important things happen there. It's all just, like, yeah. Anyway. I, I hear, yeah. Are, like, are we throwing them a resources bone there, or are we, like, not... I, really I assume that that's what's going on, right? Or they just wanted the clean sci-fi vibe and not trying to go too Star Wars with it. Like, it's definitely a, a choice artistically. But I, I really do. Now that you've said it, I really want pictures of Barlavon shaking hands with every powerful politician <laughs> in the Citadel on his walls oh, and stuff. Sweet. Like, the, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not to me because, like... I'm blaming anyone for it either. I you get know, it, like I know. Had, yeah. uh, but there's uh, the Hanar who is at the store... And they call it like, welcome to my decadent emporium. And I'm like, decadent? This is the least decadent emporium I've ever seen. In my life. But maybe that's just the Hanar being friendly because that's apparently all they do. I forgot that detail that I love so much about how the Hanar have their face name and their soul name where they, yeah. they think it's too rude to ever refer to themselves in the first person. So they always have to leave it nice and general, except for like for loved ones and intimates. Like I love that's such a good piece of lore. Where it's like, well, now I connect to the Henar. I will always remember that about them. Except for the it's fact true that of other languages, it. right? I mean like you don't really refer to yourself in the first person often in Japanese. You know? Hmm. Yeah, I don't yeah I don't it's maybe. A, uh, I, and the subject is the verb is in a whole different spot. Like there's a lot that's, that diminishes the sense of like we in English we're like, I did X and that feels very aggressive if you move that over. So it's borrowed, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely reminded me of Japan and like I'm sure I'm gonna botch this, so I apologize to everybody uh who speaks Japanese. But I remember learning once that it's like the way you compliment somebody's garden in Japan is you don't say like 
you have a really beautiful garden. It's phrased in a way where it's, I'm not worthy of being in your garden. It's always like putting self down to elevate the others. And it's like, the Han are, they're kind of like the Japanese of this game. No, I don't know. It's like, you're so tempted playing these sci-fi games of just being like, okay, this is like the analogy for this. Like the Koreans, they're like a Jewish people, but then no, not this. The like, molests make that a little difficult difficult to ignore actually, yeah, right? Right, mm-hmm. yeah, it gets murky in kind of the fun, natural way that sci-fi does. Um, fun. It's yeah. fun. It's fun to try and figure <laughs> fun out and who not is at all who. potentially fraught landmines everywhere. Yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Andrew Burns writes in saying, exploring the Citadel can drag a bit, yes, but it also really hits home what Bioware accomplished with Mass Effect 1. I think you're totally right. Technically, it's got some problems, but like the Citadel, it basically is, it's, it's what made me really fall in love with this game, but it is the cantina scene from Star Wars except instead of like, look at all these crazy things. There's a vampire guy. Look at what they're drinking. Instead, it's just like walking into a high school and having somebody be like, okay, here's all the social dynamics. Like this group over here hates this group over here because this happened 1200 years ago. But then there's this group that wants more power, but they don't want power because they pissed off this group. Like, I just love that debrief of the Citadel. Just like, here's where everybody stands. And it's a lot messier than you think. I'm just picturing like mean girls in Mass Effect and like who's what and who's who. <laughs> the fan but art exists, saying, I'm sure. Yeah, what do you what do you love about being there, Leo? It's a, a peaceful place. I love all the water. I love the <laughs> statues. I love the people you can talk to sometimes. <laughs> See, I, if l- let me put on my Joe the Genius hat. Here, here. we go. He's got wow. it on. Expectations <sighs> set. I think I think if if I could make one tweak to the Citadel section of this game. What I would do, and I know sometimes players hate when you do this, but uh-huh. I would put that that dumb thing where there are like there are places in the Citadel that are blocked off when you first get there, right? Like, sorry, Commander Shepard, you can't go this way. We're uh, you know installing a new keeper vent over here, and uh, you know you just just. Come back later. So you can't wander all over uh, the place. I, th- I think the game should have funneled you at least to the tower. Your first big objective there, your first sort of debrief with the council first, because that gives you a lot of extra context for what's going on there. And there are things that don't unlock on the Citadel until you do that. Because I think there's, I think a lot of when people think about the Citadel and the, that sort of sense of, there's a sense of aimlessness or just sort of prolonged wandering around. Yeah. And I think that has to do with the game giving you a little too much freedom right out the right out of the gate before it's really sort of laid the foundation of what the Citadel is and what you're doing there. So I think if you go, go to the tower first, and then once you have that initial conversation, which I think is the one where they say, Hey, CSEC did their investigation. Saren is is clean. Then get out there. Then your mission's clear. Then you can access everything. But I guess I feel like I, because I'm compulsive, and I think a lot of people who play Bioware games are compulsive in the same way of like, I need to talk to every person. Yeah. I need to explore every nook and cranny. If you give me a side quest that I can complete, I am going to complete it before I continue progressing the main story. Right? I think that... I think that you that that first part just gives the players a little too much rope. And it would have been a little cleaner if you get some stuff out of the way first and then set them loose. Right. I'm trying to think again back speaking of historical context cuz like when we were talking just now about like lived in details and things I was like, well, and I was like, oh, is it just the time Did it not have enough space? And I was like, well, BioShock, oh no. Like cuz BioShock is so so rich and that flows so beautifully and player gating features heavily and why that all feels so good and makes sense. In, in navigating areas, but that came out the same year. And then I know that Steve Gaynor in particular talked a lot about player gaining as narrative technique around that time or around Minerva's Den, maybe Bioshock 2. So like all of that as as sort of like industry knowledge or practice, best practice, it, maybe it's coming out around that time. Maybe that's like the moment that it was starting to be like, oh yeah, duh, better do that. I don't know, you know? But then you could also, com- I mean, that's possible. I think that you also compare like, compare Bioshock's facial facial technology to mass effects and it's clear where the resources in that and you know were were mm-hmm. spent too so yeah mm-hmm. yeah 
Uh, Doreen Clyer submits a comment on Patreon saying, One thing that really struck me is how Mass Effect had such a <clears throat> massive effect on other RPGs and how they operate now. Consider Disco hey, Elysium. We did it. You did ding, it. Ding, ding, ding. Consider a Disco Elysium with its city uh, and how thin and sparse it may look on the surface for a 20 hour game, but then you go into individual buildings and have such deep and layered conversations with multiple characters multiple times. The Citadel really set the standard for that. It is deceptively shallow, but underneath it, there are so many great side quest conversations and new areas to explore, especially in the wards. I think that's a, a great point. Can I make a request right. for no Disco Elysium spoilers? Because I waited until yes. the full voiced version and I'm not, I haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, no, no spoilers right. here. But yeah, so I, I like that comparison a lot. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to really give too much there just because of what I said about the Citadel. I feel like it is a, just a lot of like barren space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas Disco Elysium is impressive just like the density of the space. Right, right. Uh, but, Victor which will, may or may not get better with later entries in this series. Who can say? Hmm. <laughs> Victor Fam no writes in and says, I loved how small scale the Citadel felt uh, before any universe ending stakes entered into the equation. Would you be interested in a Mass Effect game that took place solely on the Citadel? Uh, for, yeah. That sounds like Dragon Age 2 is what they tried to do. Now. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I would be very interested in that. Like, I was hoping that that is what uh, Bioware was working on. It's like, just make a shorter mm -hmm. narrative focused mm -hmm. Mass Effect one off set on the Citadel. Because I remember. I think it was Casey Hudson at some point in an interview, you know, somebody gave him an impossible question to answer about like, what Mass Effect game would you like to make in the future when he was like promoting three? And at some point he's either him or Mac Walters said like, I want to make like a detective game that only takes place on the Citadel. It's like, oh, that's okay. such a cool idea. I'm in. Yeah. I love that. Watch the yeah. Expanse. Oh, that's basically yeah. what it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got to check it out at some point. Um, it's good. Manic Pixel Dream Boy writes in and says, One small detail I love that I'm not sure if it's in the original or not are the birds flying around the Citadel. It gives a real sense of the scale of the Citadel and makes all the other parts of the Citadel that you can see but can't reach seem so much more real. That's a great specific comment. Thank you so much. Wesley Barbary asks, Why are there so many doors? And why do you have to click a button to open them? I was constantly waiting on door after door to open and they aren't even automatic. Is this where the game is showing its age? And then Seth Jones writes in as well, what's up with these dang doors? <laughs> some of them open automatically and some you have to open manually. And there's no visual difference between the two. I've slammed my shepherd noggin into 50,000 doors at this point. <laughs> if it's to make me feel stupid, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> That's the design. I would, this is, here's where I'd love to have a designer on because I what I know about, it's like a Twitter joke that doors are the bane of every designer's existence. So right. what are these doors actually doing that makes them either ne like necessary or difficult or whatever? Right. And, and yeah, maybe it's the yeah. ones that need to open. They actually need that time to load Total in what's happening behind or, or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. It is definitely yeah, confusing. Yeah. But yes, the pain is real. The pain is real. Uh, Nick L. submits a comment saying, I've played through Mass Effect 1 maybe a half dozen times, but I've never really thought about what Samesh Batia is going through trying to get his wife back for cremation. Assuming mm -hmm. the internet isn't lying to me, generally for Hindu customs, the body is cremated 24 hours after death. After reading that, I couldn't help but think about how impossible that would be with space travel. Even with FTL travel, how long has it been since Nirali died? Days? Weeks? It's not something the game necessarily explains in full context, but I was just struck this time by the idea that these customs endure to help comfort people in their time of loss despite the obstacles. Uh, and Rich Carrasco also writes in saying, First time player Mass Effect, I didn't know what to expect. I'd say I was bored for most of the portion of the game, probably because of the pacing my brain expected, but it wasn't until I got to the character who was trying to recover his wife's body from the military that I finally understood what this game was all about. Can't wait to play the next bit. Can I, shout out, can I do a voice actor shout out to Brian George, who's a veteran and a G and amazing. Um, and he brings like a lot of depth and emotion to that tiny little scene. Um, it is such a really small moment. But yeah, I forgot about it, too. But it just hits you so hard. It's like, oh, of course. What an interesting situation. And I don't know. Did anybody have a strong opinion on which way they went there? Oh, yeah. I, I felt very strongly about getting that body back. as Because like I would I think it would be harder if the person that you're talking to was like, this is the only body who's been who was like afflicted with these injuries. It's right. our only chance of doing it. But instead, the guy says, there are only a handful. You know, like only a few people <laughs> received these injuries. So it was like, okay, you've got other options then. This one is this one in particular is going back. Yeah, maybe I was too much of a robot because I came in hard on the other side of like, hey. Buddy, what do you think your wife would want? She's going to save some lives. Just back off and cool it. Uh, <laughs> I didn't put it that way. But I, did. I did encourage the, yeah, I don't know. And it and what's great about this game is that that conundrum, like, you know, classic, like, 
RPG conversation puzzle like makes me think about unfinished business I have with, you know, people in my life that I've lost. And like, maybe there's a through line. Maybe that's something to reflect on there that I feel differently about it, like having an uh, having their body to mourn or to, to do all that stuff with. So like, mm, it says something about me. This 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 quest probably says something about me. I don't yeah. Know. yeah, I love that quest for that reason of thinking about it after it's over. It's like the Paragon Renegade stuff as far as gamifying it. It can be rigid like we were talking about. But this is the stuff. I loved and hope to see more of was super shades of gray in the quest and being like, did I do the right thing there? Yes. Yeah, and I think it's either a paragon and renegade ways of approaching either outcome, right? So I think so. Yeah, it felt like there were more than just, yeah, good or bad. There were right. different paths through it for sure. Right. Which I think is really part of the part of the brilliance of the framing of the morality in this game, of the paragon and renegade. It's not light side, dark side, good or evil or anything. I mean, it's the approach of uh, you know, leading leading first with sort of empathy or leading with I don't know what you'd want to say, like urgency or results right yes yes but at the, but at the end of, yeah but i mean at the end of the day commander shepherd is a good person who wants to do good things and it's just a question of i don't know if good person is the right word but like it, it ends justify the means or not you know yeah but commander shepherd has has noble and uh, like like noble intent that it's just the way you get to those results is the question. And it's, it's like, you're always going to do the right thing, but how do you do the right thing? Yes. Are you a dick about it? <laughs> that's right. right. <laughs> I, I feel like I actually was a little, this is, this is another thing about me. That's a reflection on me. Like, and part of it is the story that you're telling or the power fantasy that it's offering you is, is, you know, specter fantasy. It's military fantasy. It's all of this other stuff. That's very use, use of force. But I found myself feeling like these days, because like so many of my, like I've been politically activated in different ways in this time and, and I've been labor activated in different ways than when I was younger. So like I, you know, was showing up and sort of, you know, uh, ostensibly I would have liked to have seen successful politicians, like politicians who are actually like doing politics well, like that you've inter introduced us to this really difficult, interesting stew of things and no one's kind of showing up and being really good at politics. And I kind of wanted to see a satisfying diplomatic solution or representative or something as in contrast, because that would sort of map with a, re a Paragon renegade you know, schema, I think if you're like renegade is just, I'm going to punch them out. And then the other one's like, let's talk this through or find a solution. Like that should be represented in global politics or galaxy wide politics. I would think, I would hope. Right. You, um, so you I don't know. That's to, just a different change in me. Maybe. Hey, it's almost like, sir, you have to be that change that you want to see in the I world. Go sh by going and shooting a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, Forrest with two R's uh, says, I'm surprised by how much of a cop Garrus is. And by extension, all the specters are conceptually and textually and how little I remember that. And I'm especially worried with the pol uh, worried how the politics will age uh, as I go on in the series. I do think that's interesting, but I think what's interesting about the way they talk about basically policing on the, on the Citadel is they kind of bump that up one layer where it's like, hey, we're all worried about these specters. Like, I love that uh, the CSEC captain, Palin, where he's like, hey, I keep my cops in line. Uh, if they do something out of line, we crack down on them hard, and we've been doing this for hundreds of years. We've never had a problem. But, like, the real problem are these specters who are cops with zero accountability. Please focus your ire on them, everybody. A few bad eggs. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think, is that interesting? Does that pass the buck up conceptually to an even worse or cop situation? Is that the idea? And we're supposed to be like, oh, these ones are, is it powerful to have a fantasy of, of this way of organizing or like community management essentially that is idealized somewhat? Or like if CSEC is like meant to work kind of well, is it good to have that as a model or is that shifty? I, yeah, you know I mean, I, mean? I don't think there's examples of CSEC at least from what we've seen so far, of really being completely out of line. So it's like, I, I'm on Palin's side largely about like, yeah, they're keeping things in line here in the yeah, Citadel. Yeah, who's a terrible, 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 <laughs> terrible cop. And Garrus is well, completely entranced with the idea of going off the books and doing whatever the hell he wants. Like, <laughs> Hang on, I'll see thing. myself out. Yeah, I guess those are two. Those that's are his two whole points. question. <laughs> that's his, that's his soul journey. I guess, though, like, like Garrus, to his credit, leaves the cops, right? I mean, he, I guess he's still got that, that whole... Right, he does vigilante vigilante yeah. attitude but like he like i i think when they demonstrate the dysfunction within the police force there too that is sort of 
the straw that broke the camel's back for Garrus. I, I will say, though, his frustration seems to be with red tape and not with corruption. Oh, yeah, that is true. He just he really wants to just murder. He's like, murder I don't Garrus. like filling out paperwork. And I'm like, shut up. <laughs> Bro, just that is true. That is his baby. <laughs> yeah, it's not like yeah. everything is wrong and we're not actually doing good. It's like, I hate having to like report to people. <laughs> I'm like, you know. Yeah, yeah, the speech at when you become a specter was very it was the first time I felt like, right. oh, yeah, I guess this is a cop thing when they're like, you are the thin space colored line between <laughs> you and <laughs> the geth. And the music, too, is quite like it has, you know, it, it hits in that zone of trumpets and horns and you know, military. Heroic. Stuff, yeah. Heroic yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It does hit a slightly different. Perhaps. For sure. Uh, Stephen Hammond submits a comment saying, I feel like I missed something or there was a bug the first time I went to Korra's Den. Your team is ambushed just outside the entrance just as someone shouts, there she is! I thought maybe this would be explained, but it never was. Later, I thought it might have been a bug and those enemies should have spawned when I came back after taking down Fist. Either way, I gotta say CSEC is terrible at its job considering how often gunfights occur on the Citadel without any <laughs> response from authorities. Although Mass Effect is a space opera, it feels a lot like a Western with these shootouts here. To be fair, I started a few of those shootouts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it had to, it had to go that way. I was kind of yeah. expecting after the shootout with Fist at, at Korra's Den, I was like, oh, I have to go back to Korra's Den. It's probably got like police tape up right now because of what just happened there. But it's completely back to normal. Yeah, already. I had a quest to finish there. And all I had to do is like walk away and come back. And then it's like, oh, good. Everyone's back. Everyone's back to work. That bartender, Jenna, I can go ask. I can right. go do my business with her. Yeah. <laughs> that does sound very Western to me. Just drag the body out and onto the street and continue drinking. That's yeah, very a Western. very For clean sure. Western. That's what the Citadel is going on here. Yeah. Uh, Taylor Witt says, I clearly remember oh. uh oh yes joe i, I want to interrupt real quick about the fist thing yeah did, did you guys have rex with you in your party when you did that oh big yes. time yeah okay mm -hmm. so leo if you didn't <laughs> like if you have rex in your party he like he warns you Wait. beforehand it's like so you when didn't we, when i think we i did there, actually yeah i oh, think okay. i did at that point very briefly but yeah he kills him right yes yeah, cause, but I, cause I love rex that. tells you beforehand like if we go there i am gonna kill fist and he does. But if you don't have Rex in your party there, like there's actually a choice moment. You can choose to let Fist live or die. But if like if you bring Rex along, he's going to finish his job and you just have no say in it. I loved which is cool. My, yeah. I loved Wait, my I reaction as Shepard like when he did that because even though he was very clear in a Rex way like <laughs> I'm going to do this Shepard when it happens it's just like Shepard to be like Jesus Christ you know and then Shepard being like you cannot do that again like you listen to me buddy or you are off this team and, and I'm going to play it that way you know um, yeah, I, yeah, I felt really bad because I wanted, I was like, we don't do that, but I could have, that was obviously what was going to happen. <laughs> That's on me. <laughs> right, <laughs> I right. should have left it home if I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> you know? He couldn't, he couldn't have been much more explicit about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. And the way he shuts you back down is like, no, he's, the, a few people have the kind of ability to shut someone down with as, in as calm and unfussed a manner as Rex. He's just, he's the best. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Taylor Witt, uh, this wondering and they're concerned about what other story moments I might be missing out on depending on the crewmates I have with me. It's so fun to get surprises like the one with Fist. So he wants to make sure that he's not missing out on anything. But I guess there's certain situations, but you can't Google that ahead of time or you'll miss it out. Just take who you think would be interesting on every quest, right? You can customize it every once in a while as you go along. And uh, generally, I think the game's good about the fact that if you bring along, there's the assumption that the people that are in your party are usually the people that you like or that you're interested in. And you may yeah. like maybe have one you like and one you're lukewarm on or something to balance things out. But for the most part, it's like, like normally I like, I don't care if I miss a story moment with Caden. He's well, you boring. do now he's in your party, man. You have to care. Maybe, about that's, maybe you think that cause you haven't taken him out enough. That's right. Well, and, and I'm going to find out this playthrough. I really am. <laughs> but I guess, but that's, I guess that's the point I'm getting at though. Is like, you're probably going to see the story moments that you're interested in seeing if you're just bringing along the characters that you're interested in seeing story moments with. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark Ramirez says, I love how Bayori made the decision to give you almost all the characters towards the beginning of the game, compared to KOTOR where you're getting new characters throughout the entire journey. Yeah, it really is crazy. I forgot that it's just like, yeah, we all want to find Saren and bop, 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 bop. They're all here. You're good to go. <laughs> And I love seeing all of them. Like, there's something about that that's just exciting and engaging to go like. Who you mean on your guy? ship, or like in the mean? silhouettes in the character mm. select screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of like guessing who that's going to be. Right, yeah. right, yeah. That's it's true. like it's not even like a silhouette. It's like you can basically see 
some Asari's face in there, you know, yeah. and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hunter S. Sachs. Was, oh, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Well, there was something of just on that note about giving all the party members at once. Another thing that I really like just from the, like, story pacing perspective is the fact that it also feels the way the party comes together feels natural, which can be a problem, a big problem in RPGs where it's just like, hey, I met you at a tavern, and you're like, hey, the enemy, my enemy's a friend, and we're just going to, like... <laughs> We're going to go on this huge mission for, you know, a, a hundred hours now just because of this one casual acquaintance. Right. right? Even though Rex literally says that line. That, 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 that was a bad, that was a bad example. But I guess what I, what I mean to say is that it feels like all of these characters are naturally wrapped up in whatever's going on in the Citadel and the way that their paths intersect with Shepherds and the reason that they choose to come along with Shepard generally seems is like, I, I buy that rather I, than, I, rather than necessarily feeling the hand of the writer saying we need all these people together. So I'm just going to shove them together and put them on the Normandy. I hear yeah. you. The yeah, only one I, I think where it's a little bit of a stretch in this section is like when they start hearing about a Quarian working with the shadow broker. And then it's like, of course that Quarian must have uh, some sort of evidence that Saren is behind it the whole time. And it's like, of course, we need to get, like, that's that one logic leap where it's like, what is this? I feel like I'm missing a beat or they cut some Someone stuff. Someone says it's about Geth. I think in that first conversation, it's like there was a quarry in here talking about Geth. And so then, the, but the that, I think point. the leap that like, oh, that means she has tangible evidence of Saren being involved. I think just like that one like, quick <laughs> pivot. I won't belabor this point, but like I think that because Geth haven't been seen outside the Vale ever, been, so that would be too big of a coincidence to imagine that they're not connected. No, and there aren't a lot of Quarians around either. It's not like oh, another Quarian just rambling on about the Geth like they always do. Yeah, yeah. I think that that was how it. That was my logic leaves there. It was like there's a Quarian here. She has information on the Geth, and you're like, well, funny. We should know who's leading some Geth right now. Right. Our right. Karen. Yeah. All right. But I don't know. That's fair. Uh, Hunter S. Sachs uh, submits a comment on Patreon saying, as soon as I got to the Citadel, I beelined for Rex and Garrus. When I got Rex, I panned the camera around, saw the two of them behind me, rogue cop and ruthless mercenary, and my heart warmed, and I said out loud, it's my boys. <laughs> Hell Aww. yeah. That's very cute. I love like the little detail too cute. with Rex where he talks about like, every time I come to the Citadel, I get pulled into C-Sex security. <laughs> like, just because there's still this deep distrust between the Turians and the, and the Krogans. His line read on I'd love to see you try is just maybe, it's just the stuff of legend. Oh, I'm like, so good. Uh, arrest, like trying to arrest me. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, Shipwright says, I love the deepest dive of Mass Effect. It's one of my favorite games. One of my favorite tidbits about this section is that technically Garrison and Rex are optional squad mates. You can actually choose to not recruit either, meaning the only crewmates you need to leave with are Caden, Ashley, and Tally. It's wild how two of the most popular characters in the game and series are completely optional. Yeah. Oh, I was yeah. wondering about that, if you could really turn them down, but that's incredible. But in Mass Effect 2, they got to automatically be with you, right? Or do they really go, no. did you get these guys? Um, well, they don't. You can't talk too much about that. I will not talk too much about it, but it is not the case, Leo. So okay. look alive. Um, Empiric Unicorn says, best thing about replaying Mass Effect is being able to say to... Oh, hang on. Oh, I wanted to the tally bit. Here we go. Uh, Fielding says, "I'm this eager." Like a, is this like a Han hand thing? Are y'all are y'all sticking with Tally? Oh, is it, Tally? Is it, is it? I guess it is. Is it Tally? Tally Zora Naraya, baby. Yeah, I guess you're right. You're right. I, you know what? Maybe it's been too long. I'm going Tally. No, but I'm sure. I think actually, I, I hear. I think it literally is a, a Han hand thing where people mix it up. Yeah, actually. So I was just curious what the factions were here. I, I'm curious too. Let us know in the comments. I, I want to know. Oh no, I feel like I say Tally. Holly Voss Normandy. Anyways, Fielding says, I'm eager to hear what the crew thinks of the timer that pops up when you need to go save Tully after <laughs> dealing with Fist. You, is you, it, you know? Is it necessary? Uh, it does give a sense of urgency, which gets the blood pumping. Even after 10 playthroughs, I'm still stressed out, even though I've never once had the timer hit zero. Would you keep it or throw it out? Uh, the timer to reach her? Yeah, it's, it's fine. I wasn't too stressed out about it, I guess. I feel like it's the same as the timer for the explosions on Eden or the bombs on Eden Prime, right? It's just right. Like, it is so easy that it's pointless, but it does give you that sense of not being able to, you know, faff about. Right, right. Um, yeah. I love, and if anybody can find the name of this track, please let me know. But it's some of my favorite in this music in this section of Mass Effect is the music when you're rushing to save Tally. It's just like this. Believe it or not, it's synthy and it sounds great. But like I've li been listening to the soundtrack and I can't find it. Uh, so please let me know. Um, mm. Also, I I don't think they explained it, but when you get there, you 
kill like the people that are trying to kill Tali. And there's a couple of like those short guys in like the white full suit. And I don't mm-hmm. know what species they are. I forget if they're they Solarians. Solarian. Solarians with helmets. Is that all that is? Yeah. Oh, they look so short. All right, I was way off. Never mind. It's a low angle. I don't know. Yeah, it's confusing. Thank you. Um, Evan One Sonic says, Why does Dr. Michelle have so many enemies? In the main story, you walk in on her getting held at gunpoint before Gareth steps in. Then in another side quest, you have to take care of someone who's blackmailing her, which then my shepherd straight up says the line, every time I come here, I see someone threatening you. Why does a simple doctor have so many enemies? She is a woman. I don't know. <laughs> she dares yeah. to practice medicine on the Citadel. <laughs> I don't know. A woman in video games. She's a woman in video games. But how shall we interact with her? Yeah. I, uh, that's a really good question. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. know. She's, she's, like, she's just trying to patch people up. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Big deal is. I miss, I know the quest where you go in with Garrus. What's the what's the Yeah, I didn't know one? the other one either. When you first show up with her, she is yeah, I think she is being there's it's just there's protection money, something about protection money, which maybe just means she has a business in the lower wards. I don't know. Oh, weird. I don't know. Uh Empiric I Unicorn. Don't think I got that one. Yeah. Empiric I, Unicorn. I, I, if you go did you go to her before you have to go to her? Yeah, I Eric? did. And she didn't have anything she didn't have anything to tell me and then and then huh. I got the Garrus thing and then I went yeah. there and then that was it. Huh. You got a weird look about you, Joe. (laughs) Empiric Unicorn submits a comment saying, best thing about replaying Mass Effect is being able to say to Chorbin, you know what? This time I won't scan 20 (laughs) keepers in this annoying, (laughs) time-wasting citadel, gallivanting hide-and-seek quest of yours. Shepard out! Wow. Someone's more evolved than I am. (laughs) Did you do it? Prize. I did, and I cheated too. (laughs) (laughs) Just Googling to look at (laughs) where the keepers are. Well, the keepers are so, like, you get this big, maybe it's just because I couldn't remember if there's a payoff to it, but I, 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 because, because of spoilers and things that I do know, uh, you know, and you walk past a couple people being like, I had my office move five times. So, like, they're, it's this nice a little bit of a foreshadowy. So I did it for that. Yeah. And it lets you definitely soak in the Citadel if you really want to, but it, this really captured a lot of people's minds. Uh, Rory Gladstone sure. says, what the hell is going on with the creepy keepers? There's no way in hell I'd be staying on a space station with those freaks. I have so many questions. What do they eat? How do they reproduce? The codex says they die of old age, but their numbers remain constant. They self-destruct whenever someone has tried to study them. Excuse me? <laughs> great questions. Lots of great questions there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Leo, yep. do you know who the keepers are? Vaguely. Uh, I I I made the mistake of the hubris, really, of thinking I could do that side quest where you yeah. scan all the keepers. And of course, as I knew from the jump was going to happen, it's sitting at 19 out of 20 and I have no <laughs> idea where the last one is. If you want help, I can help you. Oh, is it like, is it always like sure. one spot? You think that's the toughest to find? There's a couple dumb spots that are also hard to even just reverse engineer from descriptions on the internet. Ugh. There's some that are easy because they're right next to landmarks, and then there's some that are like, where? <laughs> so, I think this is a change in the legendary edition too, because I I think there it's it's 21 in the original version. I think it is 21. Yeah. But in the in the legendary edition, they only require 20. So you have oh. you have the swing to, like there's there's one that you don't need to find in the legendary edition. I bet he feels yeah. special. Uh, yeah. The keepers are just fascinating. I love that idea of just like, yeah, they're these weird things that you can't really talk to that just take care of the entire citadel and like the council, every all leadership seems not at all interested. It's like, yeah, they just kind of take care of the stuff. It's just like this weird commentary in class. Just like, yeah, there's people here just kind of cleaning the bathrooms. I don't know. <laughs> I've never asked them a question. <laughs> It's yeah. There's a lot of society built on top of that unsolved mystery. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right. Joe, sorry. I, I, well, no, I guess I, part of the part of the mystery, though, or I guess part of the explanation in my mind would be the fact that, like, look, the Asari have been here on the Citadel yes. for what, like, two thousand years, right, or even more than that. Right, it's probably more. The idea being, I guess, is like, look, they spent a lot of time. I guess I'm assuming they spent a lot of time early on trying to figure that out, and just came to the conclusion through all of their advanced study, like. There's just nothing we can we can either accept that they're here and just let them do their thing, or we move off of the citadel. 
but there's no right it's the human no hubris to think that we can really crack the case of the keepers because we've seen them because we've been there for 14 minutes like hey exactly why is everybody yeah. talking about this You're right. but it is just sort of an unsettling thing like well this is fine we don't get this and it changes our, our, our actual architecture and infrastructure constantly but it's fine yeah. <laughs> you know yes <laughs> Uh, the tune writes in and asks, did anyone else get a Star Wars Phantom Menace, uh, Phantom, bleh, Phantom Menace vibe with how the Citadel Council conducted themselves in this chunk? I think there may be more influences from the prequels here than some would like to admit. Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. Just in terms of like the Jedi Council and being frustrated with Anakin wanting to join and all that stuff. But I still, I'm fascinated by the Council. I love the Council. I love the fact that it's just like, they rule the galaxy and it's just like three people just kind of making calls as they see fit. It's so loose. It's very fun. Three extremely stylish people, can oh, we say? So cool looking. <laughs> Everyone Absolutely. is tricked. Every, I was like, I want to take that Solarian's hoodie and live in it for the rest. Like it's a moon, whatever he's doing. I'm like, <laughs> I could live in that the rest of my life. Yeah. I love strong doesn't... colors. It's a comfortable looking robe. Oh, sure. yeah. I That's like great. the weird bit of lore, too, about that council and the fact that Asari lived for a thousand years. Solarians live for 40. And so it's like, that's just, imagine a Supreme Court where it has that dynamic where every 40 years one is rotating, but then one is just there for a thousand. It's absurd. Mm, mm. How long their terms are, though? Like, regardless, regardless of the species lifespan, maybe a counselor only serves for a couple of years or something. That's a right? great question. And I have no concept of, of if we know how long that is. Yeah. Do we? we have to assume it, it's the only logical way to run something, Joe, which is a life term. <laughs> they have to hang on <laughs> for sweet life uh, until the very end. Oh, uh, can I what okay, this is one of my absolute favorite moments. It involves the council that for some reason never quite stri- like I, I didn't connect the dots. It didn't strike me as hilarious until this playthrough. Yeah. And that's when you first go to talk to the council and there's giant hologram Saren up there like <laughs> defending himself, right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, he's ludicrously huge. Like, <laughs> why is his hologram so big. He's a handsome guy. To put him on equal power footing with the entire council, Smart. obviously. There we go. Visually. I, think, like, I think it's funny. It's like, like, you know, like you could adjust, like I could adjust my mic output right here and just make myself so much louder than <laughs> everyone else. It's like, it's like he's at home sitting in front of his, you know, space discord and just <laughs> popping his size meter like, up, 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 up. If, if you were a villain, you would do that, Joe. Oh, absolutely. If he has control of that size, probably. Yeah. Yeah, but the, sure. the thing the thing that really made me laugh about it, and it's partially because he's so huge and it's so obvious, is you're accusing him of working with the Geth. And he's like, I resent these accusations of Geth collusion. And one of his arms is a Geth arm. <laughs> you see it in the hologram. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically the equivalent of like, yeah, in Toy Story when... Never mind. When Woody has like Buzz Lightyear's arm and like and or no. never mind. You know what it reminded what it reminded <laughs> me of is that like the guy in the hot dog suit. Like we're all trying to find the guy who did this. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> he's like you know he's it's well it, it's funny too because you know uh, you know that he's been. Well, yes. this gets a little this right, gets a little too it. far don't do a, it. a little too far down there, but like. You compare his arm, you look at his arm to the very clear, like, visual aesthetic of the Geth. Right, yeah. right. That's what it looks like. Well, it is clearly that. But it's a hologram. You can't see detail too well in a hologram. It gets messy. You know how it goes. Yeah. Uh, That's hilarious. Uh, I've Brett, never noticed that before. <laughs> Brett submits a comment that is very much with what you were saying earlier, Sarah, saying, I wanted to write in with a comment on how weird it is going back and playing a game that was clearly written... Uh, pre a lot of the tech advances we now think of as commonplace. Smartphones were still extremely new and social media had yet to really take off, so mentions of the extranet in this game feel very Web 1.0. What stands out the most to me is Saren being convicted and stripped of his rights as a specter by the council just after hearing a 10-second recording, one completely devoid of any context. <laughs> I just immediately thought to myself, well, anyone with a cell phone could easily fake this today. There's no way this could be treated as admissible in a high court, would it? And I've been thinking about it more ever since. It's wild how much has already diverged from our time compared to the technological future Mass Effect envisioned. Yeah, for sure. That is fascinating. And like the entire time too, it's like, there's no recording. Like you think you'd have like a little body cam or something on Shepard that could have recorded this very clear, terrible interaction. Or the, I don't, the doc yeah. worker. I, I can't refute. I don't want to refute the point. Like the, the point at the core there is correct. There are a lot of things about this game that I think point to that. But... I remember playing this 
2007 and having that exact same thought even then. <laughs> right, right, right. Even then being like, this is what gets the council's number one specter, like, disbarred, is yeah. this flimsy audio evidence. I do like the fast pivot from the council, too, of going from like, all right, I don't know if we believe you, Shepard. Uh, Saren's a pretty good guy. Okay, we believe you on that front, but the Reaper stuff, I just can't possibly. <laughs> but where I roleplay these games is, you know, I'm trying to make the calls as I see fit, and I'm trying to be very empathetic to their point of view, and I'm always trying to come at it from a place of, like, human humility. And it's like, the council knows so much, they've been ruling things for so long, and it comes back to that idea of humanity just coming in too hot and having a little bit too much bravado. I mean... It's not a stretch to say, you know, in humanity, this game is definitely the analog to, like, America and the world. We're, like, late bloomer, but a strong one, right? Um, and Chris Culkins here summed it up perfectly, saying, 26 years since humanity had its first contact with an alien race, which resulted in a war or an incident, depending on who you're talking to, 26 years is no time at all when looking at everything from a galactic perspective, which all the other races are. And yet humanity has made so much progress in the galactic community by colonizing worlds, getting an ambassador on the Citadel, and most recently a Spectre, and still humanity wants more concessions. It's not hard to understand why other races view humanity in such a negative light in this game. Yeah. Agreed. I'm I'm not too frustrated with the council as of yet the story, but Joe, I know you hate the council. Uh, <laughs> Man, those guys. Hey. <laughs> I feel like I feel like they do this and okay, this is a this is just comes from a personal pet peeve of mine, right? Yeah. Where there is like where there is a there is a path that is clearly correct. And when people don't see that and this, but but it kind of got it ties into the idea of like Shepard is so convinced this is the correct path because she blinked twice and saw red goop. You know, it's like I I don't understand. Like you don't understand. You need to you need to understand that I had this vision this one time. It's like oh, hey, look, humanity. I don't even know who you are. The vision defense is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I to totally so, agree. Then what? <laughs> what? I don't know. I guess it just stories full of holes, Joe. I okay, feel really is. strongly about this. Let's come on. Council. 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 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stop rooting for the council. I you think they're monster. smart. I think they're doing the right thing. They know no, more. I mean, is, there, is it because they're in your way? Is it because they're in your way? Yes. Okay. That's really what it is. I yeah. understand. Right. I mean, I, I, I feel like the game does a good job. I, like, I, I feel like you're not supposed to like or understand the council. I feel like the game does a good job of setting you up in a very like oppositional relationship to them in the same way it does yes. with you and Udina, right? No one's like, yeah, Ambassador Udina, I love that guy. Leo, do you love Ambassador Udina? It's <laughs> a leading question that you don't have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say from the jump with the council, when they d are not interested in hearing from the witness to the murder, <laughs> that you're not supposed to like them anymore. <laughs> it was kind of like, okay, these guys are out of my... But I think like the dock book. worker was a little bit sketchy. And I think there is also still that aspect of like, they would not, they don't know how to read humans at this point yet. They have worked with the other races largely for thousands of years. And like, even the, you know, CSEC leader of the Turians there, I like his argument of just like, I don't know how to feel about humans yet. I don't know whether I can trust them. They're up and comers, but I don't know if it's kind of like in a Krogan up and coming way. And so I think there's a little bit of that where the council is just like, even if we heard from this being that we barely understand <laughs> like he's shady number one shifty panicked he's having breakdowns on the planet whatever's happening there and even then it's like it's one person's say versus like Saren who we have invested all of our power and trust into what struck me about that was that they said like dismissed him as a like uh, if the if the assertion was you planted Saren as a name in this dock worker's head that's that dismissed that that would discount his his testimony. But the but like a dock worker, if you believe that that is the testimony he gave him making up Saren's name is a mighty weird coincidence. So you have to make an accusation that we put it there or or then, yes, you should hear the testimony from the dock worker who has no stake in anything. You're right. He just produced your agent's name out of his head. You're what great. Are you talking about? That is the ace. So like, moment. I needed yeah. to hear that where you're like, you told him what to say. But I didn't hear that, which is weird. Instead, they just act classist and something. Well, and I was, like, okay. was going to say, like, Shepard wouldn't even know Saren's name because they're so secretive. But then that's right. not true because Anderson clearly has this vendetta. So I'm sure the council is exactly. looking at, like, so, Anderson's history with Saren also as, like, a way to kind of not really believe, like, this is 
a very easy path exactly. for just Anderson trying to get vengeance on That's Saren. all I needed to be drawn, and it wasn't quite done in that scene, but, right. but that's there to to read into it, but yeah, I don't know. Okay, I mean, I think th that all, okay, that makes sense from an in-universe, like, I I believe you guys, you're <laughs> thank correct. You. Oh, thank from you. An in, from, like, an in-universe, the way you you weigh the trial, but, like, I guess that's, like, Ben, you have siblings, right? You get you ever yeah. fight with your siblings? Yeah, I guess so. So, like, because I think about, I think the feeling that that's meant to, th the feeling that this sequence is meant to give you in your interaction with Saren and the council is the same as, like, Let's say that your parents go out and run an errand and leave you at home with your sibling and your sibling punches you. Right. And yes. your parents come home and you're like, they punched me. And then your sibling's like, no, I didn't. Yeah. And also, then your parents are like, yeah, I don't think you got punched. Yes. Like, uh, you well, were I there. You know the truth. You experienced it. And regardless of like, you know, in that moment, let's say you have a history of making up punches. <laughs> Your parents are like, oh, they make up punches all the time. Correct. So that, like, regardless of all the in-universe justifications for why the council wouldn't believe you, like, your experience as a player yes. is coming from a place where you know the truth and the council is there as a roadblock to you to, like, disbelieve you. And that, that I think, is what made, like, that's, that's the source of, like, my visceral reaction to them. Right, yes. But I think that that's a very intentional move on Bioware's part to set up that opposition, right? Oh, yes. Mm. Without question, the game wants you to yeah. hate the council. That is what the game wants you to do. We are, we are advocating for all the, like, we're just empathizing with their responsibility. That's yeah, there's, right. there's all of that in the world building to relate to and some conversation dialogues that maybe suggest that. But but the the stank on on the way that they shut you down is pretty clear signifier that they want you to hate them. Yeah. Uh, you you love monsters. That's the point. That's right. You love I do. the monsters. That's right, Me? Joe. Yeah, sympathy yeah. for the devil. That's right. right. <laughs> Damn, a sympathy. I wanted to see politics work a little bit, all right? Because we have this political universe and people trying to get along. So, like, could someone be good at this? Or because <laughs> the, the scale here is vigilanteism versus any kind of societal harmony whatsoever. So if, 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 if my options or my perspectives or what I'm supposed to role play is meant to be expressed in this game, maybe we didn't have our finger on the scale all the time. I don't know. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, as I think about it, that's actually a super interesting point that I that had never occurred to me with Mass Effect before is like people talk about people talk about the complex political relationships between all the races. But yeah, everyone in power just leans on the sort of like describe Turians hate humans mm -hmm. bullet point like they all just describe like the, the design bullet points of each race. There's not a lot of nuance with the way the politicians interact, which yeah, right. makes 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 the world feel like not very political despite all the codex entries that tell you otherwise. And yeah. I, and I love that early on um, when you're talking to kind of the, the hollow guide, I forget uh, her name. Um, Avina. Thank you for the Citadel. Um, and she's talking about like why these races are on the council compared to the other races. And she, she calls them the, the lesser the races. Lesser races. <laughs> right. And, and Shepard yeah. has a moment of like, Wait a minute. Like I, I heard you say that. And then she's like, I cannot judge. I'm just an AI moving right along. And I like, okay, I see what's going on here. Yeah. But then I also love this is why Mass Effect is great. Cause then she also brings up the point. If you keep talking to her about like, yeah, well the races that are on the council are expected to support and kind of defend and have a large military to defend the entire galaxy. And that's a huge financial burden for these races. And look, the Hanar. <laughs> Their economy is not exactly thriving. Like you got to be cream of the crop to be on this council. So like, I love that. It's like, at least they're trying to justify looking down on the lesser races. Well, yeah, it's responsibility. Those are, it comes with responsibility that you have to be able to muster. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, you're play So you're in this awkward position where like you're, what you are asked to play is the result of the failure of politics. Like that is your role as a, as a specter. So like the world is going to support that, but then there's this tension with the world building that's there and the questions that it's trying to get you to ask. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Braden mm. Summers says, after mm. bearing witness to Din Korlak's crack, uh, crankiness towards the humans, I was really pleased to come across a Volus and a human, uh, and they had a nice conversation in the medical center. The Volus were discussing, were discussing his recent tour of the Citadel, which gave me the sense that this location can be a community where all the species can interact and get along. It was a refreshing moment. Yeah. Uh, Ryan nice. Foshi submits a comment over on Patreon saying, The lore building in this segment of the game never ceases to amaze me. In the Presidium, there's a Krogan statue, which you learn is there as a tribute to the Krogan who are uplifted to wipe out the Rachni. 
Leo, you got all this, right? The Krogan then got too powerful, hence the genophage was created by the Salarians and administered by the Turians. All this history, tragedy, and political intrigue from a few lines of dialogue based around a statue. That is a great example of what's amazing about this section of Mass Effect. It's like, okay, let's talk about the genophage and the problem with the Krogans, but all based on the statue. And I love, too, just for that other side, with this statue in particular, it's like, yeah, look, there's the Krogan Rebellion, and we fought them for a hundred years. It was absolutely brutal. But we want to leave this statue up for them because they saved our ass during the Rachni Wars. So like, the council is still like yeah. acknowledging like we needed them, even if eventually it was a big issue that we needed to do something about. But that but that also, again, today rings true more of like, you know, going with the going with the symbolism rather than the action. Right. Like, hey, let's let's tell the Krogan that we think they're very important with right. the statue is sort of the same thing as like, hey, let's tweet our LGBTQ support without actually making, you know, like, oh, yeah, we still gave them the genophage and we're not doing anything to fix that. But here's your mm -hmm. statue, Krogans. Right. Is that actual virtual signal? Virtual signal? <laughs> <Is> that <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, yeah, I yeah. forgot like the that, lore is, that is a really interesting point. I Sorry. forgot the interesting uh, little lore detail, too, about. First of all, I love just the fact that it's split. Like, the fact that the Salarians created the genophage, but the Turians administered it. Like, that's such an unnecessary mm -hmm. split, but it's just like, try and figure out these dynamics now, everybody. Um, but then that detail in there as well about how the Salarians advance the Krogan. And this is all in the codex and stuff. But how the Salarians, like, advance the Krogans to help out with the Rachni Wars. And they're the ones that are like, get off your planet. Here we go. Look at this. And then, so they're kind of the cause of the Krogans taking over the entire galaxy and just breeding in an out of control way. Uh, I never, is, we'll save some discussions for the future, but there's a lot there where it's like, I forget how much they get into all this, but it's like, it's all in the codex right there, which are such huge beats for the series. No, yeah, there's just that uplift and then SmackDown is, is a pretty intense and interesting thing to unpack as you go through the series. But yeah. yeah. Uh, it's such a basic, it's such a basic idea, just like a, a twist on that, like, well, we got lions to get rid of the snakes and then right. we got you know bombs yeah. to get rid of the lions i don't know what it is but yeah 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 uh hell's fury uh, watching us live here at the backstage pass here on patreon uh just says lol hang in there leo <laughs> how are you doing leo is this too much i love to see you guys so excited about this <laughs> game warms my heart did you I'm not catching everything but Great oh, no. oh no! Oh no! Did you read Sorry. or check out many of the codexes? I did not know you were supposed to take that seriously until this conversation. <laughs> so I'm excited to read them more in the future. That is but Mass it, Effect. Like, I, in most games, you know, it'll you'll fill in audio logs or text things for whatever little things you find. And I just ignore them as usual. But apparently, there's a lot to get into here. Is that why you DM me at the start of the conversation? And ask who's that old guy talking? Right. Yeah. Okay. I understand that. <laughs> I initially said boo, which you cut out, I think. <laughs> One thing that people, uh, I saw people called out in the comments that I thought was interesting was uh, that the fact that so many of these codex entries are voice act, like have, yeah. ha are voiced. Yeah. And the idea that like when I first, I had totally forgotten that. So when I started at the legendary edition, I actually laughed out loud when that, when that voice started playing on them because I was like, that is so ridiculous and unnecessary. Like, I don't want to hear a voice when I do this. I just want to read. But then, 10 minutes later, as I'm just sitting back in my chair, sort of looking on my phone, but then also listening intently to every single codex entry, it's like, no, actually, that is a, that is a case of, that is a thing I wanted and did not know that I wanted. Oh, yes. Big yeah. time. Yeah. Nick Olson here wrote in saying one itty bitty detail that I love that really made me happy is Neil Ross, the voice of the Codex entries, also voiced Mayor Domino in Final Fantasy VII Remake. So everyone's yeah. favorite mm. character. Uh, Spencer Botine says, incredible. I am flabbergasted by some of the topics covered in the Codex entries. For instance, the credits entry details the universal currencies exchange rate amongst other local colony currencies. What surprised me was... The only Earth currencies to receive a one-to-one -one exchange rate were the Mexican peso, Japanese yen, and the Indian rupee. What do we think the game canon is referencing for strong currencies like the American dollar, British pound, and euro? Are they just going to get totally shafted in the 2100s? That's it, I guess. Invest in the peso if that's an option for you, Spencer. I don't know how that works. <laughs> Maybe it's just more of the galactic currencies used. I don't know. 
I don't um, know exactly how it works, but I, I love, know. but their point stands that like, it's just amazing. Like that is the level of detail that we're getting into in the codex. If you want it, it just feels like so much fun lore from a sci-fi novel just packed into this game. I definitely forgot about how, how dense and detailed all of it was. Cause I remember mostly character interactions and things. And right. So I was like, Oh wow. Easy. Are we? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's fun. Uh, Evan Dalton says reading in depth, how on how instant deep space communication works was amazing to me. Buoys acting as mass relays for communication and the priority system that determines your wait time based on position and importance in society. Absolutely blew me away. <laughs> Uh, and Barney Anderson says, I'm spending more time in the Codex for this playthrough. It was fun to learn what Mass Effect actually means. Overall, I started to really appreciate the art of making up science in a sci-fi world. I think it's a true testament to the writer's talent if they can get you to say, yeah, that makes sense, when talking about stealth technology on the Normandy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And Brian with the Y is obsessed with like the detail they go into, like how guns work in the Mass Effect universe. So it's all like this combination of the mass accelerator that combines with electromagnetism and element zero to like shave off just the right amount of a bullet. It's just, it's fun. Very silly stuff. It's like a pad of butter. You just, yeah. <laughs> I think that's how it works, but somehow yeah. uh, science is involved. And uh, somehow guns change in, in soon. Yeah. It's I, have, I have two questions for Leo. Pure, purely opinion based. Leo, what do you think about Saren as a villain so far? So far, I don't feel like there's a ton to go on, but I'm interested in him and I like the performance. You know, I find that charismatic enough to want to see more of him. Yeah. Because I this is this is something as I've been replaying this section, even as a fan, I'm like, you know, they're not giving us a lot to latch onto with Saren. And I feel like I'm probably projecting a lot onto this onto this section. So I was really curious about that. About because like you, you re- we really haven't seen him in hardly any it's, scenes. They're right? short scenes, but at the same time, like know. they let him or, really like ratchet it up. Like he has some hammy scenes where like yeah, he's kind of the flat delivery in a very serene evil way. But like when you see him on the ship and he's like, "What do you mean, Shepard got the beacon?" And then he's like growing up and like grabbing Matriarch by the face and be like, "Kill the humans!" Like he's he's got some I meaty cackled. scenes i nearly fell out of my chair i loved that scene so much i loved it yeah um I, uh, it feels early so then mm. so then my other question is do you feel like you should have more about what's motivating him or what he's doing at this point in time like you should be hooked into him more or does it feel just kind of early in the game and he's like i wonder what his deal is yeah i don't know Leo, do you have thoughts on this? I for Leo. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sure, but yes, sure. But you too. But you too. <laughs> sorry. Hey, you'll get your chance to talk in a little bit. Please. <laughs> it doesn't feel wrong. You know, if by the end of the game, whenever ha- what happens with Saren happens, if I'm still like, who is that guy? Then that's a problem. But for now, it's just his motivation is evil, and it's a good reason to get out there and explore the galaxy. And it's certainly enough for that. And in a way, it's like I'm glad it's not taking up too much of the the time. When what I'm interested in right now is all the little side stories that are happening. Yeah, and I think Ben, ben how do you feel about? Here's it? how sorry. I feel about it, sir. Let me let me really <laughs> unpack, Saren. No, I think they do a good job of setting it up by the end of this section in particular when like they are bringing in the concept of the reapers and everyone's like wow the reapers i thought that was a myth all that fun stuff which is all here and Saren clearly his goal is he's trying to do something with the reapers and we know that those are big and bad because of that killer vision um and so like i think even if Saren his exact objectives at this point aren't clear the fact that at this early on stage in the game they're saying like yeah but he's connected to this bigger badder thing like it helps kind of motivate why he's a problem i honestly feel like his performance is so pulpy to your point about it being kind of broad or something yeah i'm i feel like i'm being primed to where that's all i should expect from him and so yeah i'll just leave that unfinished but yes you know uh it's it's, it signifies mustache twirling which is great right Mm -hmm. right question two for leo (laughs) I want to know if you think the Normandy is cool. Hey, I appreciate it. I got lost on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you really, or are you being polite? Do you really appreciate it? I do appreciate it. I mean, Prove I love it. having you like it nice. actually. You can go to the engine room and stuff. Like I love that in games, and certainly, I played a lot more Kotor than I did of this, and that was something I liked about it that I'm glad to see mm-hmm. here. Oh my god, I missed that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Ebon Hawk, which I remember was very Ebon confusing because I remember I used the random name generator in KOTOR and my character's name was Malin Hawk. So I was like, well, that's confusing. The ship's named after it's your me. Baby. It's your baby. It's your, it's your, it's your little son. <laughs> which I then carried forward. That's why my shepherd's first name is Malin is because of my KOTOR random name generator. That's my wow. Bioware name. Anyways, my shepherd is named Kriya. Oh my God. Have they met? I bet they have. I think they're best friends. <laughs> I don't think they're talking anymore, but they've met. <laughs> well, it's yeah. a complicated world. Uh, Musky Goron says, can we talk about Navigator Presley on the sh- on the Normandy and how they must have went out and bought just for men in the Legendary Edition? He had gray white hair in the original, but now he has dark brown hair. Give the man credit. He looks years younger. Really? I they changed his hair? That's really yeah. interesting. Is that real? He, he definitely looks younger than he did before. <laughs> wow. Perfect. Huh. Uh, Ark Sharon says, I really appreciate the gravitas that's given to the scene where Shepard becomes a specter. It's an inevitable outcome and could have been done with a phone call, but adding little touches like being in front of the council and seeing the citizens of the Citadel gather around the chambers to watch the decision really gave this moment weight and gives you the impression that this is a big deal to everyone in the game and not just the player. That's true. It's yeah, just with, like this, that scene about just, just a phone notification. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, oh. you're a specter now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the music's that scene, huge. That scene felt lame to me this time. Like, what? I remembered it being cool. Yeah, I don't know. For me, the thing that really struck is like when they show the people sort of up in the galley, like suddenly leaning over the, the railing and like, ooh, what's going on? Yeah. And part of me is like, how are you even hearing what's happening? And what are you even doing up here? Are they like, watching like all is it like city time. council yeah, meetings where they're all just like hanging up there most of the time anyway, watching the council stuff? Listening to super sensitive briefings about like, accusations <laughs> against their top agents. <laughs> right. Like, they're like, talking exactly. explicitly exactly. about what specters yeah. are. Yeah. 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 And it's like, oh, sure. You weren't you weren't interested in leaning in when we're talking about an alien race and a specter like colluding with them <laughs> to destroy humanity. But the fact that we're pinning a medal on some weirdo with a biker handlebar mustache is <laughs> like, I gotta see this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My only thought um, was, yeah. wow, that is a Xbox 360 amount of people in that crowd. <laughs> by four people standing next to each other. <laughs> It's a great way to describe a concert that's failing. So, well, we got an Xbox 360 <laughs> crowd really here. Funny. Like a murder of crows. An Xbox 360 <laughs> yeah. posse. Right. A squad. Yeah. That's uh, funny. Johnny Magrapis writes in and says, On the squad skill tree for Shepard, Charm and Intimidator capped at three, with their descriptions telling you, when you become a specter, hey, spoiler alert game, Johnny says. Uh, and he says, I think Ray uh, Muzika... I, I'm sorry, I'm butchering the name. Uh, more, I think it's music, Musica. Okay. Yeah. Uh, more evocatively yeah. described Shepard uh, back then when the first game launched as being Jack Bauer in space. If you had to describe Shepard as blank in space now, like who would that be? Is there a new Jack Bauer or is it still just Shepard as Jack Bauer in space and that works? That's Jack Bauer. Question. Yeah, I yeah, think Jack probably. Bauer's timeless. You can't because mess now the moment in time... It matches the moment in time. So it, that's part of the signification is that right. it's a little, yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh, so, and that is, that is weird because I feel, I feel like I'm dating myself now. Like, do people know who Jack Bauer is still? I think he is was in Mortal Kombat. I'm man that I, and I know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, a crater comes in with a banger saying, so what is the Citadel Rapid Transit? Is it like a little solar pod car ship thingy all three of you are supposedly climbing into? Or why are some of them just terminals? Uh. It feels like rap, that rapid transit is like, feels like if I took needed to take a shuttle from my office down to my basement, right? It's just, it's just over there. Right, right. But it, you don't see traffic like moving in these areas. Like, but I'm like, you can, you can literally Walk from the embassies to the tower in 45 seconds. I think that's like, what's confusing. Why are you going to hop in a pod for that? That's what's confusing about the Citadel on the layout is like, wait, fast transit. Like, is there more or like, this is just what I'm looking at. It's just this kind of smaller space. It's just kind of a pain in the ass to get around. But that implies like, am I going to a completely different area? No, no, no. It's all just right here. Don't be confused. Um, I definitely use it a bunch, though. Oh, I feel yeah. like my traditional oh, yeah. Bioware was I was like, I have to walk every time or I'm going to miss a conversation or I'm going to miss a thing. But this time I definitely leaned on it some. Yeah. Uh, complimentary Waters comes to comment on Patreon saying, Quasars shamefully buried quite deep oh. in the Citadel. Did any of you find or play the Quasar machines and spend time gambling? They say Quasar sure. is aesthetically empty, just a single number on screen with two blank buttons. It's boring. Quasar is just blackjack with dice and it's weirdly arbitrary. You can only ever roll D8 and roll six plus two or fold. 
I didn't even find this. I don't think I've ever played Quasar. I played it. I did great. I won it's, twice and never touched it again. Game of the year. It, it's yeah. upstairs. It's upstairs extremely responsible flex. gamblers. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? It's upstairs in Flux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go upstairs in Flux and, and you'll find the machines up there. Though it what what is terrible about it is you go to <laughs> they have low stakes Quasar, which is funny because you can only win like 40 bucks or 20 bucks out of it or something. But then you go to high stakes Quasar where the biggest payout is 400, but it costs 200 to play. Yeah. So it's just this idea of like, I, as someone who loves money exploits in games, yes. and definitely use them if I can find them. I love it when games have gambling because you can always like, oh, well, I'm just going to play and save my game and play and you know, totally. reload if I need to. Oh, wow. You can technically do that in Quasar, but it sucks so bad. And you're only winning like 200 yeah. credits at a time. Yeah. If you're winning. And it's just terrible. Well, well, are you going to take up our man in the alley? On his... Eternal question. Right. The one quest that stays that I think per- might prevent me from completing everything because it stays unresolved, leaving you the option to use this exploit until the end of the game, I think. I don't even know what this is, though. <laughs> what is it? Yeah, you guys didn't see the guy get the Solarian getting tossed out of Flex for cheating? Oh, no, I don't mm. think so. No. Yeah, we he's got it. a little hack. He's got an exploit for the machines and you can take him up on it. Oh, interesting. Well, here's oh. another. There you go. That's interesting. For your money exploit hobbies, uh, I give unto you shells. We'll take it. He's out there. Yeah. Uh, Neil Smith submits a comment uh, that's up your alley, Joe, saying, after you become a specter, if you complete a side quest for the doctor and the med clinic in the wards, she will offer you a discount. This discount is applied when you sell items as well as an increased sale price. However, the buy back tab is universal. So you can sell up to 20 items, the size limit of the buy back tab, travel to another vendor and buy back all the items turning a profit. I left the Citadel with over a million credits and all four of the super expensive Spectre weapons from the C-Sec store. That's okay. absurd. That is, that is amazing, and I need to try that. But that also brings up what I think is an interesting point about this section of Mass Effect also. Because eventually you will get the money. You'll get the money to be able to afford that stuff. But did it strike any of you as weird that they put all of these different shops in front of you yes. and you can afford nothing? Yes, I felt like I was doing something wrong because even Anderson's like, hey, be sure to swing by that store now that you're a specter. Yeah. He's like, great, can't wait. And it's like, I can buy two bullets. Cool, thanks. It's so you can pretty woman them later. Ah, I see. <laughs> and you also, can you buy the one little licenses. Right. Which I didn't realize what they did until I asked a friend, but those, like, you get yeah. that inventory on the Normandy to buy at any time, right? Oh. The requisition officer will explain what they are to you if you navigate that convo, but yeah, that's that's the first thing you should do. Okay. So those prices like, grab those. Even that, like, I did buy the licenses, but even that is ridiculous because it's just, it's like, oh, well, now you can access this inventory that you cannot afford on the Normandy. Right. right. Like well, another later, another you place for back. you to be disappointed. Right. It's for yeah. your later convenience. <laughs> yeah. Please it's, remember. I don't, I have no particular abiding love for the whole item <laughs> equipment piece of it. Yeah. yeah. I know I spent yeah. tons and tons of time in it and I did not love any second of it. It's that. Yeah. It's not too overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andy Clark. So apologies to everyone who worked to make it cool and stuff. <laughs> That's right. Andy Clark says the comment that caught me off guard the most was when we were first in the Presidium. Out of nowhere, Ashley says, Wow, they've built themselves quite the lake. I wonder if anyone has ever drowned in it. <laughs> weird, like, weird comment from Ashley, but I like it. Look, that's that's some good personality from Ashley there. At least she's talking I think about something. We need something. to get some like mental health resources for our veterans. <laughs> I think that's what, that's what I'm hearing. That's a fun good question. It's better than her just saying, "I can't tell the aliens from the animals." That <laughs> what was that one do? stung. I was like, "Oh, <laughs> honey, we, we can't we can't take you anywhere." <laughs> like, <laughs> like, my so, God. It, it is kind of funny. To, to me, I found that interesting because Ashley says some stuff later that is definitely like more overtly racist. Yeah, she's your uncle at like the beginning of the Thanksgiving meal right now. Yeah. But, well, but the thing is, is like stuff like that just didn't register for me when I was playing this back in 2007. Yeah. Like the yeah. stuff that she says that's overtly racist, obviously you pick up on that. But it's like, it's interesting to see the nuance that the writers had for the game back then to work to work in that sort of to work it in on even those little bits of banter around there in a way that you know that 
I would say a large portion of the audience didn't even necessarily have the awareness that those kinds of things were pointing towards. Right. You know, she's just a pretty our, human. I say, do you think our sensitivity to alien species is in fact informed by the series and, and th- that our, our sensibilities have evolved as a result of it? And now looking back, we're like, oh, we weren't ready because we didn't have this game. Hmm. Also, I would like to point out, honey, most of them are, they're bipedal. It's easy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. use the same animation rigging. Don't worry about it. It's not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess the Hanor and the Elcor are kind of freaky, but it is like that interesting kind of Star Wars thing right. of like the most powerful races are the most human-like. And like, if, if they yeah. basically walk on all fours, then don't even right. bother with them. It's, it's interesting how that works. Yeah. Um, Chris H says, I love the alien designs in Mass Effect. I think the Han are my favorite. Uh, do any of you have a favorite species? That's a good question. I like that species that starts all their sentences with, you know, the kind complex. encouragement. Right. Whatever. Yes. Delighted greeting, as Ronnie Barrier writes here. Yeah, there's a lot of love for the Elcor. Uh, huge fan base, apparently, in the Minmax, Minmax uh, Patreon community, because a lot of people really love them and think it's so fun to have that set up for everything they say. But I love like just the lore detail of that, of like they had to do it because people were not picking up on the tone that they were expressing. So they need to start everything as clearly as possible, just so you know the inflection that you should read it as. Yeah, I'm not going to go too far into this because I can't speak from that perspective but like it strikes me now that like for for autistic yes folks who, you know that that would that there would be something resonant there I totally just, thought you know, of that as well like I'm I right? wonder yeah if there's anybody with autism on the I team that maybe connected to the Elkhorn in a different way but yeah I think it's a really interesting connection yeah hmm. I had not thought of that. That is really cool. Um, another robot says... I love I, that ha- Hamlet. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yes, that's exactly yeah. it. Another robot says, I'm only thinking about Elcors here. When I walked in an elevator and heard in, in entertainment news that Francis Kitt was set to direct Hamlet with an all Elcor cast, my fondness for them solidified. I want to see that performance. <laughs> also, that was one of the, la- the the lines that made me laugh out loud the hardest in this playthrough as writing because he because Kitt's stated mission, and this makes me, I guess maybe, or anyone, a Shakespeare nerd, but like they're like... He's like, I, it gives finally gives um, audiences the ability to judge Hamlet based on his actions, not his emotions. Which is hilarious because <laughs> the point of Hamlet is he doesn't do anything. That's a funny joke. Okay. Smart <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> we love it. it. Is, I, I, let me assure you, it is. It's funny. <laughs> uh, Zexerium writes in and says, the first time I entered an elevator and heard the radio, I instantly went, aha, that's where Outer Worlds got their elevator ideas from. Yeah, it's got to be weird since you're playing this for the first time Zexerium to then backwards engineer of like, oh yeah, a lot of Mass Effect in Outer Worlds. I got it. Or vice versa. So another reason not to use ra- ra- rapid transit because you get missions out of those elevator news bulletins. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. 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 Mm, yeah, I haven't been skipping the elevators, I don't think. Every once in a while, like playing on an Xbox Series X, uh, but I imagine it's this is the case for a lot of systems, but like it loads so fast. I don't know if you've had those situations where it's just like, you will see a flash of a loading screen for like four frames before it jumps to the other thing. Like at some point, fast consoles need to do something about the loading speeds and not even giving you that loading screen if it realizes it's going to be like under one second or something because it is just a jarring way to experience games now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Speaking of the elevator, yeah. I, had a, I had a moment where I was like, oh, that is a very 2007 joke where you walk into an elevator and it's just playing like dumb elevator music yes. version of the Mass Effect theme. It's like, oh, here we go. Like elevator music joke. Boy, cool. I've had enough of that. I think, <laughs> I think <laughs> Outer Worlds <laughs> does elevator music jokes too. But I think it might be like a custom jingle. I'm trying to remember exactly how they do it, but. We've all done it. We've all done it. <laughs> Uh, JT writes in and says, oh, actually, better yet, Darkfish Days writes in and says, at first I thought it was strange to see paper on the Citadel desk. I mean, these people are working at Minority Report interfaces and next to them is a stack of folders? But after assisting in two covert scanning missions, I get the sense that everyone is always scanning and hacking each other and paper is probably a much more secure way to go. It's six button presses to get into anyone's computer. (laughs) Yeah. And you, exactly. just, you just have to play Simon Says to do it. Yeah, yeah. Jeff Enright wrote in saying that he was really frustrated by that, saying he couldn't it wasn't working for him or something, but I th- it's really easy for me. Am I good at games? Is that what's happening here? I lost the first time because it's the tutorial said repeat the button input. So you were as fast waiting. As possible, and I was waiting for it to finish. Yeah. Yes, that is true. I did that exact thing. That's totally true. Um, let's see. Uh, JT says zooming out, looking at the different destinations in the galaxy really blew my mind as a teaser mm-hmm. of what's next. I'm looking forward to where we're going. Uh, yes, that is true. Hopefully, you haven't seen and that it too galaxy much. map music. Oh is- my god. 
so good. It yeah. is absolutely it's fantastic. Nice. I actually did not, I did not open up the galaxy map in this, in this chunk because that's how I wanted to start section two as, oh, as we go smart. It's like, I want to start with that music, looking at that big old map, getting yeah. overwhelmed by all of the different planets. <laughs> oh, it's going to be fun. Just Jack Sparrow, bring me that horizon. You know. <laughs> well, speaking mm-hmm. of galaxy map, next chapter, is there anything we have not talked about? Have we missed anything that anybody wanted to bring up? Speak now, forever hold your peace about the first five hours of Mass Effect 1. Mm. I had one thing. Yes, sir. Aboard one thing aboard the Normandy that I just love when games do this thing is when you're walking around as Shepard and those sort of like incidental guards that are just standing there. Yeah. Give you a oh, you yes. Walk, you know, and it's like, it, it's still a 2007 game in that I can like whip out my assault rifle and like write weighing on the wall Correct. and have it still like no one's no one bats an eye. But it's just one of those things, you know, I think players are so used to in games, the world around them being inert in so many different ways that you have to like actively interact with. I have to talk to someone before they'll talk to me kind of thing. I just like that idea of there being a sort of like ambient response to the player's presence. Yes. Yes, for sure. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see. Leo, do you have any thoughts that we haven't hit? No, I'm excited to play more. I like the Citadel, like I said, was my ideal Mass Effect situation where it's 90% talking, 10% combat. And so we'll see how I feel in the future when it's not quite that ratio. <laughs> it, it definitely We're isn't that ratio. Add another action into the mix, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, we got a lot right. of fun adventures to have. It's going to be a good time, everybody. Uh, and you can join us for it if you've enjoyed this conversation. Uh, we would appreciate your support and we would love to read your comments. If you support us at the $2 tier on Patreon over at patreon.com slash Max with two N's, you can submit a comment and we will read it during the next big old discussion. And of course, you can unlock the podcast version of The Deepest Dive moving into the future. And for that next discussion, it is going to be two weeks from when this video is posted. So for the next discussion, we need your comment submitted on Patreon on May 31st, Monday, May 31st. So not this coming Monday, but the one after that. And for this section, we're going to be covering Artemis Tau, Novaria, and Pharos. So basically the big three objectives that you have at this point, and you can do those in any order. Yes, Joe? Well, so here's here's the thing to, to keep in mind. Yeah, you should be able to do... Pharos, Neveria, and Artemis Tau in any order. Okay. I think, I think the way this works, though, is after you do two of them, a new option called Vermeer opens up. Okay. Don't do Vermeer. Do the other one of those original three. Yes. Because we're saving Vermeer for the okay. third chunk. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So just do Artemis Town, Avaria, Pharos, the big three quests right now. And then we'll be talking all about that and reading all of your comments over on oh. Patreon Accomplishment Max with two ends. Yes, Joe. And that I think the bulk of the side quests are going to be available there too. So I think that's a thing that we're, we're going to want to talk about. Like there are going to be a lot of those incidental, like go to this planet, do yeah. this thing, all of that stuff. That's probably going to be the next episode is probably when we're going to be talking about a lot of those little side. So you want stuff. side quests in this chunk too, just because it's the kind of two week gap for the deepest times. So it's going to be, I think that that's going to give us the most, I mean, you don't have to do all of it. You don't have to be, you, you can save some of them, but I think just in terms of the discussion, yeah, I think that's the way we'd want to do it. Cause there's also, I, I mean, I guess, tell me if I'm wrong, but we are we going to want to talk about the DLC in the third chunk also? I guess so. Y- yeah, I don't even know. I don't think I played I the remember. DLC. Which DLC are... are I, for the if film? I'm remembering correctly, it's Bring Down the Sky. Uh. Okay, yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about that all that in the future. And that seems like a good third episode. So for this one, yeah. Side quest in this area in Artemis Town of Area Pharos. Uh, and that's going to be, yeah, May 31st over on Patreon. So we look forward to reading your comments. And uh, thanks for watching this. Thanks for listening to this in particular. And uh, thanks for sharing it with uh, other fans of Mass Effect. Any help sharing it online is deeply appreciated because we're creating the deepest dive, dang it. And thanks to all of your comments for making sure that it is truly the deepest dive. Um, Leo Vader, thank you for being a good sport. You didn't roll your eyes once, which is really amazing. <laughs> Though he did go off camera for a little bit. And he rolled his eyes so hard they're bleeding. (laughs)
He was just pulling a whole sarin. He was just destroying the, <laughs> the house. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. <laughs> That's it. Just rolled my eyes a quick full 360. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, Joe Juba, thank you for coming out of retirement for one last mission to talk about Mass Effect. <laughs> what is your life like these days anyway? You know, it's 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 a little quieter. It's not bad. Yeah. What's the weirdest part about leaving Game Informer? Boy, you know, I think for for me, the weirdest part is is that sort of sort of reestablishing a boundary between my life and my hobby a mm. little more, you know, because like I there was always I don't know, it's like like when your job is your hobby that on one hand, that's a thing that is great. But on the other hand, that makes it a little bit harder to delineate like this is my personal time and this is my work time. Right. right? Sure. Um, so sort of, yeah, reestablishing that has been, uh, you know, it's, it's taken time, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun. Oh, that's awesome. You mentor people. <laughs> <laughs> Life coaching. Uh, Some people are lost causes. So. Oh. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything you want to plug Joe, even like your Twitter handle or something? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm really not, I'm really not active as far as video just games. Say stuff. Your, just, just say just your, just say your Twitter handle. So, okay. Uh, at Joe Juba, you can follow me there. <laughs> There we go. Sweet. I'll be posting. I'll, I'll be posting screenshots of Mass Effect probably for the next every week punch. Or two. I want every punch. <laughs> Memorial. And hey, let, let me plug everyone else on this panel here too while I can. Yozetti, Leo Vader, S. Amale. That's Amale. it. You got it, mm-hmm. Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Um, I hope this wasn't Thanks. too draining for you. Is it about what you expected? That's great. No, this is great. This is super fun. Okay, perfect. Thank you yeah, so yeah. much for lending your expertise oh no it's my pleasure obviously i mean i could go i was about the thing i was going to leave us with was like another detail about the first contact war so i'm like it's good let's stop now i'll save it (laughs) (laughs) save time we got some still uh space politics to talk about but sarah uh what would you like to plug uh plug i don't know i guess tomorrow what's today tomorrow a show that i'm a live action show that i'm dubbing drops um so i don't know who killed sarah season two hey and that's like on your youtube channel or it's not Netflix. You know, I mean, you can watch it on Netflix. But um, oh. are, we, are we understanding what job I did? No. So there's I'm a I'm so confused. Show. You said, who killed Sarah? I'm like, is this just like, that's it's the name of the Sarah. show. Oh, okay. okay. It's All the right. name of the show. <laughs> the name of the show is Who Killed Sarah? It's a foreign show that I dubbed into English. And you oh, can okay. find it on Netflix season two. Um, which is fun. It's a bit of a mystery, <laughs> and that character is really fun. Uh, so watch it, I guess, or, or don't. But um, <laughs> what else? I mean, Twitter. Yeah, I'm talking on Twitter. Sell Male. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. That's it for now. That's oh good. no! Oh my God! There's so many things I'm streaming this week. What am I talking about? I'm doing a charity stream for Feminist Frequency on Friday. I'm doing a Shakespeare stream, um, including with Jennifer Hale and some other folks on Sunday. What? Um, what else? I don't know. It's all happening. I'm going to be a part of the NYU stream for their final projects on Friday. That's always fun checking in with the students and what they're up to so yeah it's a busy week that and i'll be fun. streaming again role-playing soon so i don't know anyway there's a lot awesome i'm cool. really bad at plugging i don't remember yeah it was <laughs> more so confusing than i was expecting but i still. regret to inform you that i cannot mentor you with a uh, with a list like that <laughs> <laughs> i need so much help the pandemic has made it so much worse it's very bad <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for the support and for watching and listening. And we're looking forward to the next two discussions for Mass Effect 1. A lot of people are saying, keep going. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, if this, if this like, breaks a million views or something, we will definitely keep going. But uh, we'll see how the traffic does. But thanks for your support. Thanks for even wanting that. We appreciate it. Cool. And then we'll see you uh, two weeks from now for the next chapter of the Deepest Dive of Mass Effect 1. Thanks so much, everybody. Be good, have fun. Let's go. If you are sick of snark, clickbait, and an avalanche of movie news, you can help support independent games media by subscribing to MinMax's YouTube channel here or checking out the benefits over on Patreon. It's a nice, clean handshake. You support us, and we won't make dumb, condescending stuff for you. Your support helps us continue our mission of focusing on games, friends, and getting better. Patreon.com slash MinMax with two N's. We'd appreciate it.